Hello, Denya. Now, tell us, how are the Greens doing tonight? Because we have been reading out the odd game that we've seen. Um, I don't know how many you've got on your list there. Yeah, well, you just caught me scribbling down the latest because new results are coming in all the time. Um, it's seeming really positive, um, to be honest, as you can tell. I'm probably quite sounding quite excited. Um, so in South Tyneside, um, we've doubled our numbers. We've gone from uh, three to six Greens, so we're now the uh, second party after Labour there. Um, we've also had gains in uh, Colchester. That was a gain from the Conservatives and from Exeter, Stockport and Plymouth, as news has just come in. It's not that many, though, is it? Uh, the night is young. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Gareth Knight, we, we, we have talked about the Greens' performance in local elections quite often on these programmes. And there are certain areas of the country where the Greens have done traditionally well. Um, I mean, obviously, Brighton being the, the pre... pre, pre what am I trying to say? Pre-eminent one. Pre-eminent one, I think I was trying to say. Um, well, they did control the council for a time. I don't think you do at the moment. No, do we do. You do. You yep. do. You do now as well. Yep. Um, Bristol, Norwich, but they've always sort of flattered to deceive. Never quite make the breakthrough that you think they're going to. Why is that? Do you think? Um, a lot of it is to do with just national trends. Um, the Green Party, we, we've spoken on many election nights about the, the fact that the Green Party has always been a little bit stuck. Like all parties, they're coalitions. Um, but there are a lot of people that would vote Conservative that are interested in things like recycling and may go to the Greens there. We saw quite a big movement last year, actually. Um, people worried about green belt development and they were shifting to the Greens from the Conservatives. However... There's always been a, a, a significant section of the Green Party that really want to be socialists. They want to be eco-activists. And I think that there is a clash there that has possibly meant that the Greens have struggled to break through. Obviously, the Greens have got new leaders. So uh, you know, this is something that I know that you will have been addressing quite a lot. Um, but it is difficult, I think, because the Greens, by definition don't have yet the national presence that possibly means that people massively favour them or oppose them nationally and therefore the councillors are able to appeal um, on a ward-by-ward -ward basis. I mean, it's, it's fairly difficult for, for smaller parties to break through. I think what could be interesting is the Greens could form the opposition in Richmond after today. Um, you'll definitely be keeping an eye on that because there is a chance the Conservatives could be wiped out, but the Greens could actually make some gains there from the Lib Dems and form the opposition. And that'll pos possibly give them a bit more of a basis. They have had the odd one councillor, you know, a councillor in Camden, a councillor in Islington. Like, yeah, there's, there's, but I think they need to actually form an opposition and create a bit more of a platform. And there are several London boroughs where we're expecting to make gains. Um, so, yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on, on several London boroughs and I think we could end up being the official opposition on a few of them. And I think the interesting thing is, from from your point of view as a, as a new leader and a non-London person as well, that your campaign, the impression I got was that you were very much saying, look, let's not stop focusing so much on London. Now, if you come out of this evening with gains in London and gains elsewhere, that is a very positive sign. Um, but the interesting thing is going to be, you know, where do you take that? Um, you know, the, the, there has been a little bit of a, a limit to the to the green success. Mm. Robert, you wanted years. to come. Yeah, in. I was just going to add on the point that just been made i i'm expecting the greens to have a continuing good evening not in huge numbers but the point about the london boroughs where labor basically has a hegemony in terms of islington newham uh, haringey all those sorts of places hackney so that there is every prospect that the greens will have representation on a fair number of those councils not necessarily all of them and it won't be more than a one or two in some places, but uh, I'm expecting the results to continue to trickle in for the Greens on a positive basis. So to go from a sort of local focus in these elections to a national, even an international focus, and Gareth made the point about the, the sort of limit of the Greens breakthrough so far. Yeah. If we look at Germany, the Greens are in government. Uh, why, why is there not the sort of breakthrough in this country? Is it possibly because of army policies like leaving NATO, for example? <laughs> um, I don't really recognise your characterisation, to be honest. I mean, you, 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 you mentioned Brighton and Hove and, and Bristol and Norwich, but you've missed out. So, yes, we do run Brighton and Hove Council. You missed out the other 14 local authorities where Greens are part of the administration. And I think it's probably not in the councils that you would expect. It's places like Sheffield, uh, Her rural Herefordshire, 
Lancaster. You're quite strong in central Suffolk as well, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we're quite strong in East Anglia generally. Um, so it's it's really, I think, I think, sorry, but some journalists have a stereotype of the Greens that actually isn't yeah, connected but, to reality. But you, but you play into that stereotype, as Jackie has said, with this ridiculous policy of coming out of NATO, oh, but only when the war in Ukraine is over. I mean, how do you think that is going to get you votes from sensible people who clearly see it as a balmy policy? Well, talk me through that. Talk me through that. Well, no, you tell me through it. It's your policy. policy. Well... <laughs> Yeah, and I... And I, I mean, and which I, came out a week before the local elections. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It's been our policy for years, if not decades. Well, no, it can't have been because the Ukraine war wasn't happening decades ago. No, our, our, we have a long-term policy that um, we don't... The... the basically, um, nuclear superpowers being pitched to one another, that, that mutually assured destruction model... Um, that, which, that which, has, which has worked for, for decades. Well, has it? It hasn't stopped war in Europe. Well, it stopped a nuclear war. I, th I think that that nuclear threat is, is, is what is um, making it hard for us to make progress against come Russia. On, well, it come on, that, come on. Come on. Hang, hang on a second, Jackie. So, if, if, you do, if you don't mind. I'm, so, so just to clarify. If you tell me that if we get rid of our nuclear weapons that Putin is less likely to use his, you are barking mad. So this country has signed the, nu the, um, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This country supports multilateral disarmament of nuclear mm, weapons. But you don't. You support unilateral. And yet, and yet, what has this country done towards that multilateral disarmament? Actually, since we signed that treaty, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen the government do anything on it. And so I'd like to see the government take more action towards that. But just to be really, really clear here, this isn't a new policy and this certainly is not a policy to come out of NATO straight away. That would clearly no. be a stupid but your, idea. But your co-leader, Adrian Ramsey, it was either this week or at the end of last week, said that you, your policy was to come out of NATO, but not until the Ukraine war was over. Most people would think that is just barking mad. Because the Ukraine war proves that NATO is absolutely vital to our defence interests. So, to clarify, it's not a short-term policy. We ultimately want to work towards a future where NATO is not necessary. And really interestingly, NATO's own uh, founding documents have a clause which envisages a future where NATO is not necessary because the security situation has moved on. So all we're saying is that we aspire to a future where that kind of oppositional model of security, that mutually assured destruction model, is not necessary. And instead, we build for a, a, a future that is based on peace rather than based on militarism and one where we have, we have you know... We, we we have international agreements. We're not saying no, that we would withdraw from international agreements. That's we, I I disagree with your your policy. But it was a genuine question about why in Germany, the Greens have been so and it's and I think it's more than the electoral system. Why in Germany are the Greens fundamentally important for the government and have taken a very different defence and security approach in relation to Ukraine than you're suggesting, and yet in this country you take a fundamentally different approach. You're successful to an extent, to a very small extent, in a few councils, but it's so, it's sort of miles apart the extent of your so success. I, I think that the voting system does have a lot to answer for, even with the number of it, you know, if, if, if the voting system didn't change how people voted, which of course it would, because if people thought that who they wanted to get in could get in, then they would often vote differently. But even if you just looked at the votes that we've got in previous general elections, the Greens would have dozens of Green MPs here if we had a proportional voting system in the UK for general elections now. Um, I'm, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's crazy that the UK still uses this old first-past-the-post system. I don't know if you're aware, but there's only one other European country that uses first-past-the-post for its national elections, and that's Belarus. I think we've learnt a lot about Belarus in the Well, there are all lately. sorts of arguments you can make about electoral <laughs> systems, but associating us with Belarus is not the, not the best one. That well, you it is make. the thing that we have in common we, with them. We have a first-past-the-post system for our... Parliament. We, of course, have all sorts of other electoral systems in different parts. Not for much longer. You may be aware well, that the Conservative government is 
getting rid of the more proportional system that's currently used for city mayors and returning to the more regressive, less democratic first-past-the-post system. Um, Louise Hay, do you, do, do you think that there is a problem for the left in general where there will be, I mean, maybe the sort of Corbyn supporters might be rather attracted by the policy that Carl has just articulated there and all parties are coalitions and it's quite difficult to hold a left of centre coalition together, right of centre, I and mean, there's only the Conservative Party to vote for on the right, but on the left, you've kind of got the Liberal Democrats, Labour and the Greens. Is that a problem for Labour? Well, I'd say the Conservative coalition is pretty broad at the moment and splintering. Um, you know, if you think well, about no the types of voters... Well, there's no other parties, really, are there? I mean, there's a Reform UK, but it, doesn't, it hasn't gained any seats anywhere. Well, there's there's plenty of places for people that voted Conservative in 2019 to come to, including back uh, to the Labour Party. And um, results are coming in now that show on tonight's results in Hartlepool, for example, we'd win the constituency in the next general election. Um, really good results in Cumberland, in uh, in Workington, where we uh, we lost the Copeland by-election under Corbyn, now, now looking good for us as well. So we are starting to peel back some of that coalition that the Conservatives managed to build up. And in a two-party system like we have, obviously, Obviously, it's important that we are that broad base and we do represent people from uh, from Wandsworth uh, up to Sunderland via Workington and up to Scotland again as well. And it's really important that we do well in Scotland tonight as well in order to build that. And I think, you know, under Keir Starmer's Labour, putting forward a serious plan to tackle the cost of living crisis is a very large part of the reason why people have been coming back to us uh, during this election, but also just a, a very deep dissatisfaction with, with Boris Johnson and his complete lack of moral leadership. I heard that time and time again on the doors uh, where I've been all over England over the last few weeks and there is a very, very deep dissatisfaction. Um, people maybe not coming immediately back um, to Labour straight away, but certainly not voting Tory this time. Where are they going time. then if they're not coming back to Labour? Well, I think, there's a, I think the general dissatisfaction, I think some people probably haven't voted at all this time and that will mm. be reflected in the turnout figures and we've obviously got to work on that for the next general election and I think of, often people will sit out the local elections in a way that they wouldn't in the general election. We see that in, 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 in turnouts all the time, don't we? Um, but I, yeah, I think we, we've obviously still got a bit further to go, but I think the results tonight are starting to look very promising Is the dishonest Boris attack that Labour has made blunted by the attack that Keir Starmer has faced about his beer and his curry this week? I, I, I genuinely don't... Do you know what? It actually did come up on the doors twice for me today, but by people saying it is ridiculous to compare the two. Durham Police investigated Keir Starmer and found no rules have been broken. Number 10 Downing Street is the most fined workplace in Britain. You know, this is not comparable. And I think the desperate kind of smears to muddy the water between the two yeah, have Jack, been... Yeah, no, Jackie, you're, sm you're <laughs> smearing. You're smearing. Yeah, it's not the first time tonight I've done it either. Eh? Robert, I was going to say... Two observations. One, I'm not convinced, looking at the figures that I have done so far, that the Labour Party is clearly on its way back to be in a position to form a government at the next election. Parties in opposition, the lead party in opposition, should normally, if you look at what the Tories were doing in 90, 2009 and you go back to, would normally be in a very much stronger position than this. The other observation that I'd make in relation to beer gates and party gate is that actually that's a damning observation in relation to politicians in general. And one of the figures that I was looking at before I came into the studio is that turnout seems to be down it's always low at local elections, mm. but it seems to be lower than ever well, this time. I, I've got around. a text here from a former cabinet minister in the Midlands. <laughs> you can probably all guess who it is now. I said, what's, what's your analysis of what's happening today? And he said, massive abstention, mainly because of Boris in good areas, probably lack of interest in less good areas. When he says good areas, he means Tory areas, I imagine. <laughs> um, and it'd be interesting to know. Let, let's talk a little bit about the effect of turnout on elections in a moment. When we come back, you're listening to Election Night Live on LBC and LBC News with me, Ian Dale and Jackie Smith. It's 18 minutes past two. This is LBC. The books
LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Text 84850. Um, several people commenting on the green policy on NATO. Somebody says, I would love to vote green, but I will never vote green when they have ridiculous policies like this. I am one of the many. And um, somebody says, now Ian Dale turns nasty against the Greens deputy leader. No, I was quizzing Carla about a policy, I th holding her to account. Was I nasty? Well, meanwhile, while... while uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think it's interesting that you're all sitting here saying, why doesn't the green, why don't the Greens get support? Meanwhile, my phone's vibrating off the table with messages talking about all the new seats we're winning all up and down well, the give us, give us some more. Um, I've now got, uh, we've got gains in Cumberland, Amber Valley, the Wirral. Um, interestingly, Cumberland and Amber Valley are both from the Conservatives. Uh, the Wirral's from Labour. I mean, that is interesting, isn't it, Gareth Knight? Because the, the gains that Carla's described, well, some that we, we've talked about earlier in the programme as well, they are across the country. Whereas if, if we were talking 10 years ago, we would have just been talking about Brighton, Norwich and Bristol, probably, wouldn't we? And this, and this is the reason why the Greens are, have, have got a real difficulty. I mean, if we were talking about proportional representation a moment ago. <laughs> oh, it's um, a real difficulty winning if, seats all up and down England but, and Wales, but, gosh. But, but you said yourself <laughs> that, yeah, there's there's a limit. And you, you said that the electoral system is part of that. And, and yeah, that, that might be true. But, of course, the thing is, is that if you change the electoral system, you change the entire dynamic of politics. The Green Party would, you know, would argue... Uh, fa Arguably, every political party would split to a degree. You'd have many more political parties. They wouldn't need to all be united as such because they could form coalitions with different parties. So you could have, you know, the Orange Bookers of the Lib Dems c combining with the Cameroonians, combining with the Blairites. You could have all sorts of coalitions. So the Greens, as they currently exist, only exist because of the first-past-the-post system, which forces you to have this coalition of people who, you know, the sort of swampy brigade on one hand versus the <laughs> sort of... versus the versus the people that vote Conservative that think that the recycling system in their council is terrible. So you've got I a mean, huge coalition there. I'm pretty certain that Green Party members don't vote Conservative. <laughs> well, well, you, you, oh! the, 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 members, the members don't, but it's very, very clear from you looking at the electoral results and where you're making gains that people who are loyal Conservatives Conservatives yeah. who Absolutely. have voted Conservatives yes. their yes. entire life are voting for your party. And I mm. think that yeah. if your party is going to make progress, you need to start embracing that, recognising so that. So you're, one of the things you're right had... that lifelong Conservatives are voting for us, but many of them are saying on the doorstep, never again. It's not It's it's not that they're voting one well, way or I don't understand the why. The I don't understand why, as a leader of a political party, you actively are... You, you, you're you appalled by the idea of people voting for you. Surely the idea is you want people to come and I'm vote not. for you. Um, and it doesn't matter if they voted Conservative or Liberal Democrat or Labour before, no. but you need to be attracting Conservative voters. And we are in huge numbers. Uh, in the local elections last year, um, we got around 100 new seats and that was almost exactly evenly split between... Um, Labour and Conservative seats. So we absolutely are attracting votes from across the political spectrum and I think I think we must have misunderstood each other there but, but, because that's that's absolutely a positive as far as I'm But la was it last year? I was just disagreeing with perhaps you missed Carl, you need to talk into the microphone. Oh, I'm so sorry. Turn around um, and actually look at him. <laughs> <laughs> That way lies madness. I, I, I think we may have misunderstood each other. It sounded like you were saying Green Party members are voting Conservatives, and I think that's highly unlikely. I think we'd, we'd probably all agree on that. But um, I remember Gareth and I having a discussion. I can't remember which year it was. It can't have been during the pandemic, because we didn't do these during the pandemic, um, about where the protest votes go. They used to go to the Lib Dems, and then I think the Greens got quite a lot of protest votes. Um, and... I mean, I'll be quite honest, if there'd been a Green candidate in my ward in these elections, I might have voted for that candidate. If just, I'm mean, not because I necessarily agree with anything they said, Who but as, as a pro... I, I think we already covered that, didn't we? The, Tum <laughs> the Tunbridge Wales Alliance. Oh, you've owned up to it now. Oh, oh did, did we not say no. that earlier? Oh, no. <laughs> I oh, know we said we're doing it until half past five. Exactly. Anyway, okay I've, okay, I've admitted who I voted for. But in terms of a protest vote, if you can't vote for the party that you've always voted, you look to see where that vote can go. You don't vote enthusiastically necessarily for mm. another party, but um, the Liberal Democrats in the 1990s, they were the recipient of that vote. And, and I, I think going back to our discussion on NATO, I mean, I, I couldn't. I mean, I just couldn't, knowing that policy. And don't you think that's something that you... I mean, we had a, the tweet there earlier from somebody saying exactly the same thing. I couldn't vote for them when they've got policies like that. I mean, all I can say is what I already said, that we have people who 
are telling us that they are voting for the Greens and they had previously voted for other parties. I mean, the nature of being a growing party is that every election you are persuading people to vote for you who've never voted for you before. That's, you know, that's that's how growing your support happens. And so speaking to people all over England and Wales over the last few months, yes, we are getting people coming to us from the Conservatives, from Labour, from the Lib Dems a little bit as well. Um, and and very often they have been lifelong voters for those parties before. And yes, you're right that initially often it comes from a dissatisfaction with the party they voted for previously and, and, and a negative feeling and then they're shopping around. But what we are finding is that once they voted for the Greens once and they got a Green elected and they saw how hardworking that Green councillor was, then they stick with us. OK, right, let's go to Roy, who's in Eastbourne. Hello, Roy. Hello. Good morning, all. Hi. <laughs> Poor lady from the Greens. She obviously hadn't briefed herself in that question on NATO. Um, now, now, I think it's clear what's happening in England tonight. The two losers are the two main political parties, Labour and Conservative. And I think Labour will lose more than the Conservatives, purely because they've got more to lose. But the ones who shouldn't be crowing now are the Liberal Democrats. They're picking up less than half of these lost seats. They're going to Greens that most of us think are apolitical anyway. But the winners tonight are the apolitical or the independents. Uh, I mean, this really is... is uh, what, what the electorate are saying here is that we just don't like our politicians. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure you're right because, and Gareth may be able to elaborate on this, but I don't see a massive increase of independent candidates standing or even winning. Um, there's, they are, they are. The, the difficulty the independents have, though, is that um, you know, Andrew Mouse spoke earlier on about the importance of having an independent candidate as a good spokesman for the ward. The thing is, is that if they then take control of the council, they don't actually have any idea mm -hmm. about what to do as a united group to deal with things like the council's procurement policy. So you tend to find that they quickly disappear out of power very quickly. Um, it, but you do find that the independents do do well because if if people are disillusioned they're a fairly safe bet. Now, the reality is, is that there's no real such thing as independent. Exactly. They wouldn't be involved in politics <laughs> if they were that independent. Um, but, of course, you know, the great advantage they have is they're, they're not tied to a political party. But they very, it's very, very rare that you'll get an independent group controlling a council for very long because... It, you know, political parties do exist for a reason. They do unite people behind a general philosophy. Um, ben Kentish, let, let's talk a little bit more about London. A uh, result in Hillingdon, where Labour have gained a seat from the Conservatives at 50.6% versus 49.4%. Um, any Ch uh, Charville Ward, I don't know if you know Charville I Ward, do. Robert. Um, any straws in the wind as to the main councils in London? Yeah, it looks, it's looking very, very good for Labour in London, Ian. It seems pretty certain, I think, at this point, uh, that Barnet is going to flip, possibly by as many as uh, four council seats to Labour. That was a big, big target in London. It's looking pretty good in Wandsmouth, the source there, telling me that it's very early days. They've got a lot of uh, work to do to overturn some big Tory majorities, but they say the early signs are pretty positive. Also pointing out the significance of that, Ian, that Labour didn't even win Wandsworth after the 1997 or 2001 mm. landslide election victories. Now, of course, there's been demographic change. It's a much younger area than perhaps was back then. Similarly with Barnet in, in parts of the borough. But it is looking very, very strong. Hillingdon's an interesting one. As you say, Labour's gained a seat. They've also lost two from the con to, to the Conservatives in Hillingdon. Uh, so that's one to keep an eye on. But if, if the Tories do lose Barnet and they lose Wandsworth, that would be a bad night in itself. And then we get to Westminster, which even uh, that seems to be in play for Labour now. Tory sources still saying they think they possibly possibly, and this is a bit more on a knife edge Ian, but could uh, have such a bad night that they also lose Westminster, which has been Tory since it was uh, formed. And there'll, oh, and there'll be an interesting question then about how Tories respond to that. Mm. Um, it seems that the Tory leader in Carlisle has already announced his dissatisfaction with the Prime Minister. I was talking earlier on about uh, Tories in Worcester who uh, sort of and well. Sunderland, you know, there's Tories across the country now um, that will be piling the pressure on the Prime Minister and on their own local Tory MPs to be putting their letters. Um, apparently Labour have gained another ward in Wandsworth Trinity Ward. Sadiq Khan is apparently
apparently in the middle of the celebrations, uh, as well he might be, I guess. Um, somebody else says, I'm confused. Why have you got three MPs as guests? When I voted earlier, it was for my local council. MPs have no say in local council decisions. It infuriates me that the national parties have hijacked local politics when they have no say in local decisions. Well, how can I say this politely? Um, I'm not sure that hosting an eight-hour yeah. overnight election programme just with a series of local councillors... They're all at their council. Well, also, <laughs> what would actually... Exactly. If I, if I, only got one if I went... To, well, we have actually. Yeah, but, OK, three politicians. But if I went to my boss and said, actually, you know, I think we should have a councillor from X Ward in Plymouth, or I know I'd get a pretty dusty response, well, and rightly too. Can, can I just come back on these question of the wards? Because I think it's important in London. You referred to Charville, for example, and, and Ben identified it in passing. We're now talking about three member wards. And I think, given the margin that you're talking about in Charville, it's likely to be split. And that's why you have difficulties in getting the results quickly from the war, from London boroughs because most of the wards have multi are multi-member and and in a fair number of them there'll be split representation and under those circumstances you have fairly lengthy recounts because you've got to check all the the multifarious combinations of votes that you see under those circumstances we are about to say goodbye to louise haig i think she has done a marvelous shift I'm off to sky now you're, you're off to <laughs> You're not saying. <laughs> Honestly, you're a glutton for punishment. I've oh, so <laughs> done some terrible things in a Wolf. previous life. <laughs> well, we thank you for joining us thank for the you. last hour. And in a moment, we'll be joined by your Shadow Cabinet colleague, Thangam Debonair. It's 2.31 on LBC and LBC News. Lottie Morley has the news headlines. The Conservative Party is braced for losses in London as votes are counted after local elections across the UK. There'll be declarations coming in overnight in some contests in England, but that won't happen until tomorrow in Scotland and Wales. Another effort is underway to evacuate civilians from the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. The United Nations says it won't go into detail to avoid undermining the operation. And Oxford University has announced a fully funded scholarship scheme for Ukrainian refugees. It'll begin later this year and will support highly qualified graduates from Ukraine whose lives have been disrupted by the ongoing conflict. LBC weather, cloudy for Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight, mostly dry for England and Wales with a low of 8 degrees. This is LBC. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Would be when the next. It's two thirty-four on LBC. Um, we were talking about Plymouth earlier, which looks to be one of the more interesting counts. So let's cross to the count there. Andy Ballantyne is our reporter there. Andy, uh, we we know now the Green Party is tonight gained its first ever council seat in Plymouth. Any other results? 
Uh, Ian, yes, we've had a couple of results. They're coming in thick and fast now. They're mainly, to be honest with you, either Labour holds or Conservative hold. But the first result here in Plymouth of the night, and it was the first shock of the night. For the first time ever, Plymouth has a Green councillor with a majority of more than 400. New councillor Ian Poyser was in shock when I spoke to him earlier, despite the fact Plimpton Chatterwood was a targeted seat for the party. He got 1,274 four votes and the Conservative candidate in second got 770. It was a two-horse race with the Green Party and Conservatives both saying a vote for Labour was a wasted vote. And after knocking on nearly every door in the area, the public heard that message which has cut through and worked. A campaign based on local issues about new towns concreting over the countryside. Yes, there were some national protest vote, but mainly a local election won on local issues. Talking to political experts here, we we think this is the first time the seat is or the, the ward has changed hands since its inception in the 80s in a great result for the Green Party and their first ever Plymouth councillor. Now, uh, Andy, I'm going to do something that no presenter should ever do to you, and I'm going to bounce you with a question that you may not be able to answer. <laughs> um, do you cover Bristol in your area? Uh, no, I don't quite go up okay, that far. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew I would we, live to regret that. Bristol. We got okay. one of right, Carla, for a moment, <laughs> because we have three Bristolians on our panel tonight, because Thangam Debonair has joined us. She is Shadow Leader of the House of Commons, Labour MP for Bristol West, omnipresent on LBC last week, so uh, good to have you back again. Uh, Robert Hayward is with us, former MP for Bristol Kingswood. And Carla Denya is here, and you are a local councillor. I, 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 I should have said that to the texter, shouldn't I? Indeed. We have, do have a yeah, councillor on yes. the panel. And Jackie Smith, you used to be a councillor. And I took slight exception to your view that somehow or another... usually you do. You know, exactly, <laughs> that you wouldn't get interesting comment or ideas out of council. Well, it's not... You have to have a bit of star quality on election nights. That's what you're providing here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Carla's providing from my <laughs> council position. Anyway, well. and I was a councillor as well. Exactly. Okay, all right. We were getting yourself into a hole. I am. I am. I, I am. I'm a, bit, a bit like you did earlier. Um, <laughs> Carla, you you are. Uh, just tell us about what's going on in Bristol because there's a referendum in Bristol on whether to get rid of the mayor. Now that's quite interesting. How's, how do you think that's going to go? That's right. So, um, 10 years ago, Bristol was one of 10 cities uh, which the government mandated to have a referendum on whether to bring in a directly elected mayor as a new position. Uh, and Bristol was the only city that uh, decided to do so. But it was on a turnout of 24% and only, I think, about 51% in favour. So really, it was only actually about 12.5% of the population that voted for it. Uh, and so we've had a directly elected mayor running the council. Now, the problem with that system, it sounds good. You know, it sounds like, oh, more accountability because you're electing the leader of the council. The trouble is that it is also an intense concentration of power in the hands of that one person who's given much, much more power than the leader of a council would be. And it takes power away from the 70 directly elected councillors. Uh, and that, in my experience, I've worked under that system for seven years, does not make for good democracy. It, it means that decisions are made behind closed doors by the mayor and his hand-picked closest allies. And it means that in Bristol, where we've got 24 Green councillors mm. and 24 Labour councillors, and then smaller numbers of the other parties, because the Labour mayor n narrowly won the mayoral election, it's a completely Labour administration where he's handpicked a completely Labour cabinet and Labour have a, almost 100% of the decision-making control, even though that's not what the people voted for. Isn't, isn't he quite well thought of, though, the Mayor of Bristol? Marvin, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Marvin Rees, yeah. that's right. Um, uh, well, I think <laughs> we'll find out when we get the results of this referendum what he's thought of, but certainly uh, I have... From the door knocking we've been doing, there, there's some mixed opinions. Okay. Let's say. I mean, let, 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 it's, go on, It's Jackie. interesting, though. One of the things that we've talked about is the extent to which there's sort of interest and turnout in these uh, elections. One of the things that you can say about a directly elected mayor and that you can say about Marvin is people know about Marvin and they know that he represents Bristol and they know that he's given Bristol uh, a voice. And however much, you know, and we many of us have been local councillors and we've been talking up for them, the type of sort of slightly diffuse leadership that you were talking about and, and praising 
doesn't get that sort of profile and wouldn't have got the profile for Bristol. But can I ask you a question? If you had to choose between your city being famous and your city making good decisions for the well-being of the people who live there, which would you prioritise? I would want my city to be able to have a voice that would get resource from government and that would be able to to uh, bring, attract investment and to actually have a name for so, itself. So since Bristol brought in the city mayor, um, we've gained a West of England metro mayor. And that is and actually the one. position that now has... Extremely good one. The, the power to bring in that investment um, and so I, I appreciate they're not exactly the same role but there's a substantial amount of duplication between those roles and so my argument would be do we really want this intense concentration of power in the hands of one person without much accountability at the city level when we've also got a metro mayor at the next level up? Uh, you're making quite a sophisticated argument on this programme about getting rid of the mayor, but I bet you've run a campaign locally that basically says, get rid of this tier of politicians, we don't need them. And that undermines the locally elected democratic politicians. It's you not can go and read the article that I, I wrote an opinion piece for the Bristol Post just a couple of days ago, and you yeah, can go and read I mean, it. I, I, I doubt it's the <laughs> opinion piece in the Bristol Post that most that is the message that you're giving out on the doorstep though is it um right let's let's go to ben kentish and gareth knight because i think this whole idea of elected mayors it, it it's been a bit of an experiment and we've got quite a few of them now over the course of the country there's a referendum in bristol um ben what's your elections in, in london sorry and several being elected in london so yes. elected mayors in Ireland, yes. really? Yes. Um, what, mayors, yes. Ben Kentish, what, what's your feeling about the success of this this office of mayor? Do you think it's likely to be rolled out more widely, or if Bristol votes against keeping a mayor, do you think that's likely to happen in other areas? I think there's been a huge variation across the country, and a lot of those metro mayors, very few people, including their own areas, have heard of. But then you have other places, Andy Street in the West Midlands, Ben Houchen in the north uh, north east, and you've got Andy Burnham Andy in Greater Manchester, <laughs> where. <laughs> All three of those, Sadiq Khan, um, Steve Rotherham, all very, very popular in their patches, all become significant political players. Um, and Marvin Reese in Bristol is another one, Labour men in Bristol. And they've been, they've had an impact. They've become figureheads. They've been champions for their regions. A lot of some of those are now being talked about as potential uh, future leaders. Ben Houchen, for example, very highly rated in the Conservative Party. Andy Burnham widely tipped to be looking at a, a, going back into Parliament. So yes, there are undeniably, and I think areas where they've worked really well. That said, there are other areas where I think they've had less impact, been less popular. At Bristol, as you say, having its referendum now. Uh, so I think they've got a future for sure but ultimately it has to be up to local people to decide whether they want a mayor in their area or not. Carla? Uh, your listeners might be aware that Sheffield also had a referendum. Um, so that wasn't about the mayor. They had a leader and cabinet system and they had a referendum last year where they voted to switch to the committee system, which is what the Bristol one's deciding between as well. Um, and that was uh, in for kind of similar reasons that brought about the one in Bristol, I would say. Um, it was a, a, a quite a, a domineering Labour administration in Sheffield that made some um, made some decisions that weren't universally popular, and that and that caused some upset amongst local residents, and that yeah, that's what led to the referendum. And and, and once we've got the results from from Sheffield, uh, then those newly elected councillors in Sheffield will. Just just to Make say that the house. London boroughs with directly elected mayors are Hackney, Lewisham, Newham, Tower Hamlets and Croydon. This is the first election for a Croydon mayor. I, I suppose I knew about Tower Hamlets because I looked for Rahman, but yeah. I must admit I didn't know there were all of those yes. mm -hmm. in London. Well, Croydon's going to be a, an a interesting potential uh, opportunity for the Tories. Um, and as you say, Tower Hamlets is an issue for Labour because of Look for um coming back from his... Uh, not being able to run because of his prosecution and um, has has obviously been the, the mayor in Tower Hamlets previously. And thank you. Um, going, going back to Bristol, I know there are, there are no elections in Bristol mm -hmm. at the moment, but you, you've heard what Carla said about the elected mayor. How do you think that referendum is going to go? Presumably you're, you're supporting keeping the elected mayor. Well, I was in Swindon yesterday, actually, because what I'm trying to do is, is make sure that... You're lucky you made it here with all those roundabouts. Uh, so, <laughs> do you know, there is actually a roundabout called the Magic Roundabout. I know, I've been round it, it not several magic. times. <laughs> 
<laughs> not magic at all. It's, it's, it's very confusing. Um, so I spent yesterday in Swindon where I was trying to make sure that good Labour councillors were returned. I've been around... What um, about the bad ones? <laughs> 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 the thing is, what I think really matters to people in the end is, can they afford their bills? Are their kids getting the school place they want to? It's outcomes that count. And yesterday's referendum in Bristol, well, it was £60,000 of taxpayers' money that I don't think many people are going to have turned out for. And if Carla's making a turnout argument for the referendum that happened in the first place, it will be interesting to see what happens if the turnout from yesterday turns out to be even lower. I, I, I suspect it may well be, unfortunately. I think what really matters is whether or not you get Labour representatives bringing Labour values to people's lives and making sure they've got money to be able to spend on their bills and to cover and that's at the moment those are the real issues that i found coming up on the doorstep in swindon can i just pick yeah. up on the question of tower hamlets and mayors in general um tower hamlets i'm willing to make a prediction now that look for Rahman will be re-elected as the mayor of tower hamlets um come the count in the next few days because we never know how long it's going to take in tower hamlets <laughs> the, the the other it's obs not is it? <laughs> no, it's not. the other observation i'd make is that actually the the conservative government has created far too many different systems of local government and we've got a mess across the country we're talking here this evening about some councils that are second tier district councils and that refer up to county councils we've got new unitary authorities covering huge geographical areas like like north yorkshire there was reference to elected mayors for bristol on top of which you have an elected mayor for the west of england yeah. to be honest we have a, a local government system that at the moment is a well, mess yeah, and needs substantial we have a Conservative government who say they want less local government and then everywhere you turn they're creating more of it. Well, ironically enough, they're not. And in terms of numbers of local councillors, if you look at the last 20 years, local councillors have gone down by about three to 4,000 in total. Because of but, but, because, but you yeah. said more... But yeah. extra can layers I, can because I, can of... I, can, I, can I just finish? But of course the great irony, and I'm now going to get on a hobby horse of my own here, while uh, government is reducing the number of local councillors across the country quite dramatically um, we have far too many members of parliament and far, even more far too many members of the House of Lords um, Gareth Nye I, I wanted to hear from you on uh, elected mayors uh, have they had an impact do you think it all depends on who holds the post. Um, certainly, you know, people will pull out the particularly bad ones or the particularly charismatic ones. Um, and it does very much depend on who holds the post. But in terms of the sort of democratic mandate that a mayor would have, one of the reasons why these were brought in was to give people a, you know, a very specific person. And it, you've got to say, it hasn't really worked in terms of boosting turnout, boosting involvement. Um, if you look at Newham, where I lived for a long time, um, every single councillor there was Labour. Um, and the mayor there had to pull the cabinet from the council. It was about, you know, there's about three or four different types of mayor, even for boroughs. Um, the whole system, as Robert said, it is a complete mess across the country. And... You know, political parties will generally support the retention of a mayor if they're the party that actually has the mayor and support the abolition of it if they don't. And I do think that something needs to be sorted with this because um, almost ever since, I think it was um, sort of a second term under Tony Blair project, they started tinkering with local government, creating lots of unitaries. And then the Tories said, absolutely not, when we come into power, we're not going to stop all of that, no more messing around. And of course, they instantly started doing it. Mm. And I really think that the political parties need to get a bit of a grip on their local government policy because it's just creating a, a mess everywhere, everywhere you look. And what was interesting, of course, was as part of the uh, levelling up uh, white paper, it was widely briefed and to a certain extent delivered in the white paper that de more devolution and more... Um, uh, elected mayors would be one of the solutions to um, levelling up. Now, arguably, that could have been because there weren't a whole range of other uh, policies that came through that levelling up uh, white paper. But the other thing I'd say from previous experience, and I think Taylor was actually absolutely right about this, there's no better way to turn off the electorate than saying, what do we want... Uh, 
to rearrange your local government arrangements. When do we want yeah. it? Now, you know, <laughs> nobody says when, that ever. exactly. So when nobody when actually the issues that will determine the next election will be the cost of living, yes. will be to a certain extent what people feel about the party. Leaders. Right, we'd like to get some more callers on the line. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is a number to call. Uh, Labour have held Lincoln. Labour have gained Cumberland from overall control. The Lib Dems okay. have gained Hull, and it is rumoured, or more than strongly rumoured, that the Lib Dems have gained Gosport. It's two forty nine. This is LBC. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's 2.51 on LBC. It's Election Night Live on LBC and our sister station, LBC News. We are simulcasting, which is great. It means we get even more people watching and listening. And I hope you are watching on Global Player um, because you can see all of our panel in their resplendent colours. They're quite colourful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, Car Carla is a bit stereotypical green. I am but, on brand. But two shades. Of course. <laughs> do, you, do you always feel that you have to wear green? No, I don't. And actually, I was wearing less green, but I'll let you into a secret. Um, there was an overly splashy tap when I went to use the facilities oh. before coming into the studio. And so I had a wet mark on the front of my blouse. And so this scarf went on at the last minute. You see, to hide the, if the Jackie and I were recording the For the Many podcast the now, <laughs> we, we would be in full flight, wouldn't we? <laughs> We utterly but would. I think yeah, it's yeah, still yeah. too early to get into full for the many mode, don't you? <laughs> but I am a bit, depressed, a bit depressed and disappointed in you, Ian Dale, in uh, falling um, for that. Let's comment on female politicians and commentators, in my case, clothes. You've, you've well, fallen I mean, to be fair, them. I'm not going to commentate on Gareth Knight's jumper, am I? Although we did, I, mean, I, I, did. I, we I could comment on Ben off. Kentish's rather lovely tie. Yeah, yeah. It's quite dull. And Robert Hayward is not looking like a member of the House of Lords. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we're disappointed you didn't come in your ermine. <laughs> As we say on the podcast, you've let the programme down, you've let your country down. Anyway. Um, Gareth, any more insights from any results that you've got for us? Uh, a big win for Labour in ones with taking one of the key wards, Trinity. Um, but again, you know, caveat on this, big boundary changes, so let's not... You know, be too certain, but I mean, everything is saying that Labour... Get off that Wandsworth. fence. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, I've, I've been there before with Wandsworth. Um, <laughs> you know, four, four years ago, we, we were all predicting that Wandsworth um, would go Labour, and it didn't. And wh what ended up happening was Labour closed the gap quite significantly, but they just failed to get over the, over the top. Um, in Hillingdon, you know, the, it, it seems to... I'm picking up a sort of a slight nudge to Labour, but only a very slight nudge. It doesn't look like that's going to go. But it's Do you like... have any intelligence on Harrow? Um, we've got a, t a tweet here from Helen who says, does anyone know what's happening in Harrow? I only had Tory or Labour in my ward in Harrow. Um, two million missing money. I don't know what that means. Just on that, Ian, Labour, uh, Labour sources claiming that it's looking tight in Harrow, and that would be quite astonishing. Uh, they had to lose quite a number of seats, they had a majority of seven on that council. Now, this is a bit of expectation management, of course. This source also saying, completely writing off Westminster, they say it's never even a target, there's no chance of winning it, and we never thought there was. So you're now in a situation where both the Tories and Labour are claiming they've lost Westminster. They both can't <laughs> be right, of course. This is the expectation management. If, if Labour lose Harrow, that 
that would be quite incredible. I suspect that won't happen. But on Wandsworth, this same source that's being very cautious, who was saying just an hour ago, too early to call Wandsworth, now saying... It's very, very unlikely that the Tories can win it. So Labour are very, very confident they have taken Wandsworth. That is a significant step if that proves to be the case. And Barnet too, very, very confident there. The uh, Edgware Berry Ward, which was seen as a bit of a... I'm going to use that yep. word again, Bellwether, you know what <laughs> I'm going to say. Why did I start this? Key marginal. Thank you, Robert. Key marginal, key marginal. please. Um, key seat. Uh, the, the Tories have just taken that by only 100 votes, so it's not going to be easy for Labour in Barnet. But despite that, and they had hoped to take Edgewareberry, they're still pretty confident of taking the council overall. Just on Harrow, um, on that two million that I mentioned, the local MP, Conservative Bob Blackman, claimed recently that roads are in a poor state because two million pounds of council taxpayers' money was being given to contractors and the contractors were not actually doing the work and then the council staff were receiving kickbacks. So I suppose that might... Again, as I said earlier, local circumstances sometimes we, we don't we don't know all the local circumstances. So if there is a weird result here. It could be due to that. Now, Carla, I'm imagining by the look on your face, you've got positive green news. Uh, no, actually, oh, right, okay. I've got interesting Bristol mayoral referendum. Oh, <laughs> we don't have the result of it yet, but we do have the turnout. Such a tease. And I'm afraid that <laughs> Thangham is uh, was incorrect in her guess the turnout for this referendum is higher than it was uh, when we had the original one 10 How years much? ago it's 28.6 oh, come on. so it's not as high as it's, i would like it no it's well, not factually, well, she's, well, factually she's right so, factually she's right so there's two things there's two things here one is it, it's higher than last time the other is and you know it's not great i would like it to be higher the other is let's look at why it's low 10 years ago uh, when we had the original referendum the council produced an impartial information leaflet to explain what the referendum was about and what the choices were. This time around, the Labour administration declined to provide that. So it means that voters in Bristol just received a poll card with basically no information about what it was about. And of course, those of us that were campaigning to switch to a committee system did our best to communicate the arguments for it, but we're reliant on the local media to run those stories. And we're reliant, to a certain extent, on the council administration to provide that information, and they, they declined to do so. Well, I know you're leaving us in a moment, so we're, we're not going to get your reaction to the result of this referendum when it comes in, Unless it comes Unless in the next, it comes in the next <laughs> few minutes. But, uh... Wait, count faster! <laughs> Can I just say that in relation to Harrow, Harrow was the sort of place that I was expecting the Conservatives would win if the opinion polls were neck and neck or slightly in favour of the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. It's It's been trending towards the Conservatives and it's an area of aspirational Asian migration and they are changing their voting habits as they go out to Harrow and the area. So we've had a lot of sort of detailed um, statistics and uh, turnout uh, information and that's obviously important but in politics so are images and uh, one of the things that makes me think that Labour are probably quite confident about Wandsworth is the appearance of Sadiq Khan yes. and Rosina Alin Khan being photographed uh, together tweeting together. I don't think you do that as a London mayor unless you're feeling reasonably mm. confident that you've mm. got a win coming your, in your direction. Mm. Let's read out some texts and tweets. Sue says, Hi election team. You know what I love about your coverage as well as professional expertise, expertise and analysis. That's you. Uh, you also <laughs> know how to have fun. <laughs> so <also> important. <laughs> <laughs> Best coverage around and politics obsessive that I am. I have ears and eyes on all the other coverage. You are simply the best. I'll collect those tenors later. <laughs> um, somebody else says they're listening in Nashville, USA. I love it when people listen to Paul. I just get a real kick out of that. I, I still do. All around the world. Is excellent, Tasmania excellent, still the furthest Can I say that's an excellent city? Went there for a rugby tournament only a few <laughs> years ago. What, what happens in Nashville stays in Nashville. Yeah, I hope so. Couldn't um, possibly comment. And somebody else says, I'm playing tournament. a game. Every time one of the presenters or guests says 1997, I pop a pound in a jar. It'll be very full soon. Also, I don't think this constant harking back to new Labour will serve Labour well. That, that goes back well, to well, no. earlier in the programme. Oh, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't start. In don't start. <laughs> Earlier on in the programme, myself, Siobhan McDonough, Angela Smith were having a slight reminisce. Oh, I think it would be I wish I'd been say. here. <laughs> I think three was quite enough. To be, to, 
to be honest, if I may say so. Um, good morning, Jack and Ian, says Abby. Oh, no, that's the one. Abby in Surrey was very concerned about Gareth's jacket. She thought he was overheating. So I'm not going to bother reading that out because he has now taken his jacket off. And um, can you and the panel discuss the impact of campaigning, expected impact of campaigning in seats? I only got leaflets from the local independents and the Lib Dems. And despite the fact I would have voted Labour, I thought, well, if they can't be asked, then neither can I. For context, I live in a Tory stronghold, Epsom and Newell. Um, and all the local elections in my village go to the independence but i was still surprised at the lack of effort p.s you and jackie and ben kentish are the perfect election night threesome who <laughs> are you happy with that comment ben <laughs> take it in how are you feeling so, about that <laughs> such objectification <laughs> right we are about to say goodbye to carla denya and lord robert haywood and we're going to say hello to baroness susan kramer and um well it says hello ben kentish here well he's i think he's he's being promoted to the big boys table <laughs> big finally i've table. made it <laughs> anyway, um, we are. it's three o'clock on LBC. We have three hours of our election night programme to go. Hope you'll stay with us right to the bitter end and then stay and listen to Nick Ferrari because he'll conti be continuing the local election coverage. You're listening to LBC. It's three o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at three o'clock, results of the local elections are coming in from across England. The Conservatives have held Basildon but are bracing themselves for a difficult night, especially in London. Labour MP David Lammy told LBC voters are losing faith in the Tories. A lot of people really struggling, uh, a lot of people that don't feel supported. And of course, there's also that sense that politicians are out of touch. Now, that's not just unique to the government, all of us pay some responsibility for that. Labour are hoping to benefit in the city, especially in Barnet and Wandsworth. In Hull, the Lib Dems could triumph over Labour, and the Green Party has been welcoming some of the seat gains it's made. LBC reporter Andy Ballantyne is in Plymouth. The first result here in Plymouth of the night, and it was the first shock of the night. For the first time ever, Plymouth has a Green councillor with a majority of more than 400. New councillor Ian Poyser was in shock when I spoke to him earlier, despite the fact Plimpton Chatterwood was a targeted seat for the party. Counting starts later in other areas of England, as well as in Scotland and Wales. A rescue effort is underway to get more civilians out of the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol, a key target for Russia. The United Nations says a safe passage operation is in progress, but it won't confirm whether that involves people trapped at a steelworks. Alexander Rodnyansky, an advisor to President Zelensky, says Russian forces aren't allowing them to get to safety. They've uh, basically prevented us from rescuing our people. They're shooting at civilians coming out or shooting in the vicinity of civilians when they are trying to come out. And so thereby they're basically undermining the whole effort to rescue them. Oxford University has announced a fully funded scholarship scheme for Ukrainian refugees. It will begin in the next academic year and will support highly qualified graduates from Ukraine whose lives have been disrupted by the ongoing conflicts. A police officer is being investigated after a man died when he was hit by a Sussex police car. The 27-year-old was walking on the South Coast Road on Saturday night when it happens. Britain could see its hottest day of the year this week. The southeast could be warmer than Mallorca tomorrow, with temperatures climbing to the mid-20s. LBC weather, cloudy for Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight, mostly dry for England and Wales, a low of 8 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Alice Bell. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good morning. It's three minutes past, th past three on LBC. I hope you're watching us on Global Player. Uh, Luke is. He says, I've just discovered that airplaying from the Global Player app streams the video feed to my TV. Game changer. Hello from California and thanks for all you do. <laughs> that, that is a for the many in joke, by the way, in case you wonder why he said that. Uh, Paul says, watching the election coverage here in Davis, California, while I cook dinner. Great mix of information and entertainment. Um, so, 
do let us know where you're listening to us or watching us all over the world. Now, we still have Thangham Debonair with us, Shadow Leader of the House of Commons, Labour MP for Bristol West. Uh, Baroness Susan Kramer is with us, Liberal Democrat peer and former MP for Richmond Park. And Jackie Smith has just made it back into the studio in time for... I got I got back in time. See, this is perils of being a woman going to the loo in this place, isn't oh, it? With, easy. <laughs> so that's the problem. The ad breaks are always shorter overnight, so you don't have quite the, quite the time. And Ben Kentish has joined us uh, on the desk as well. Um, now, Gareth Knight, you have some news from Barnet. Yeah, so West Hendon, which has been a, a swing ward for a long time, even, you know, despite the boundary changes, has gone Labour in quite spectacular style. They've won that by a big margin. Barnet is a really important borough. Um, three Conservative MPs, each of them with fairly small majorities. Um, but the two political parties, the Labour and the Conservatives, are very active. It's actually quite a healthy area for politics. It's a, it's a good area to, to be in if you, if you enjoy your politics. And um, the trend that seems to be going on there is that... Um, that, that rock-solid Jewish vote um, that came out in such opposition to Corbyn four years ago, um, that seems to have softened quite a lot. Um, but the Conservative vote is holding up very well in Finchley and Golders Green, um, not holding up very well in Hendon. West Hendon is Matthew Offord's seat. I think his majority is around about 14, 1500, so it's quite good news for Labour, both nationally and locally. Um, the, the Conservatives need to you know, be winning quite a lot of seats there. Um, it's, it is, it, although the stereotype is that this is a very Jewish area, it, it isn't. Um, it's surrounded on all sides now by areas that used to be quite conservative and now have gone, gone Labour, Enfield, Brent, um, Hampstead down in the south. Um, so yeah, the pressure is on and three Conservative MPs. And the other important thing about Barnet, as we touched on earlier, is that while uh, Wandsworth is significant because of its history as a council it's got three Labour MPs already whereas Barnet as you say Gareth has got three Tory MPs so uh, Labour success in Barnet might point away to the general election or to things that will need to change for Labour to win in a general election almost more than Wandsworth would. How, how much is demographic change at, at, at foot here because I, I suspect particularly maybe in, in Barnet and maybe one or two of these other northwest London boroughs as Hillingdon, we've talked about Harrow, Harrow a little bit earlier. How is demographic change meaning electoral change, Gareth? It, I mean, ben and I were actually talking about this in quite some depth. Both of us have lived in Barnet um, quite You've a lot. You've lived everywhere. I've, I've lived <laughs> East, in, <laughs> where, where have we gone? Eastleigh, yeah. Newham, Barnet? Yeah. You, you live, where do you live now? I live in Lincoln. Grantham now. Grantham. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I've, I've lived everywhere. No, no, we, I, I lived in Barnet for quite some time and um, there's no doubt it has changed quite a lot. Um, it used to be a, a proper suburb, um, you know, very, very conservative with a small C. Um, you get quite big migrant populations coming through there, including lots of people like myself that left university and moved into Golders Green when we first went there and surrounded by people very similar to me. By the time I left, that demographic had changed quite a lot. And... Um, but demographic change does matter because a lot of people are now moving out of London and, and it's a, it, there's no denying that there's been a big demographic change. You look next door at Enfield, it used to be a solid conservative area and it's certainly not that way anymore. Does Barnet have Finchley in it? Yeah. Yeah, so Barnet is is chipping. It's basically the top bit of the Northern Line, if you think in terms of the tube map. So it's it's Hendon, um, High Barnet, um, Mill Hill, um, down to Finchley, Totteridge. Golders Green, Totteridge. Yeah. Um, well, well, in that case, I can houses, say. In Totteridge. that case, I can say that I have lived in Barnet as well. And not only. <laughs> oh, was that when <laughs> I was in Finchley? <laughs> yeah, you've got you've got a story about in living in Barnet. I lived you? in Finchley and I shared a flat with Caroline Flint. Do, do you want mm. to um, tell us the story of when you went home one night in your ministerial car? Oh no, that wasn't. That was much much oh, that later. Was a different yes, one. yeah. This oh. was this was quite soon after I'd finished being um, a student, whilst I was still involved in student politics. And Caroline Flint and I shared a flat and were active in the uh, Finchley Labour Party at that point. Active in many ways, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> You've never listened to our For the Many podcast, have you? <laughs> I would gladly listen to it. Do you, do you want to hours. tell the story about your ministerial? No, I don't want to tell that story. No, no, no. <laughs> I've told have it. To... That's the type of X rated content that you only get on but the For is, the Many podcast. This is very, very, <laughs> this is very true. Um, ben, you wanted to talk about London as well. 
But yeah, we'll have I think date on that. what Gareth was saying is, is, is spot on. There's been a big demographic change in Barnet particularly, but also big parts of London too. The risk for Labour, of course, and this is a trend that we've seen over some time, is they pile up votes in metropolitan areas like London, like Bristol, Oxford and Cambridge have been more Labour than they were previously. Obviously, Lib Dem, a lot of Lib Dem support there. And actually, the number of seats that that gains you at a general election is relatively small. Barnet is a, a slight exception because the three seats... Chipping Barnet, Finishing Goddard's Green at Hendon are all Tory. They were all uh, Labour, apart from Chipping Barnet in 1997, for example. But actually, even if you won every seat that Labour didn't hold in London, it only gets you a fraction of the 120 or so you need to win a general election. So, yes, it's significant that, of course, they are winning some of these outer London suburbs, it seems. But when it comes to the national picture, and even if they won it easily, it doesn't really come close to what they need to do. And that's why I go back to places like Dudley and Nuneaton mm. are actually far yeah. more significant when it comes to a national election. What do we need? Well, well, what needs to happen? We, we, we need to know what's going to happen in Scotland. <laughs> we need to know what's yeah. happening in the South Coast. There are any number of council um, councils. We need to know what's happening in Wales as well, you know, because yeah. sadly for us, and it is sadly, it grieves me greatly, we lost some very, very good MPs in 2019 from Wales. Uh, we lost a lot in Scotland in 2015. We have masses of work to do to rebuild. I'm, I th I'm really wary of making any predictions about what these elections say for Labour's future general election success until we end tomorrow. Oh, today. Are we on? Is it Friday? <laughs> 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 these results because that's that really matters this this talk of the red wall yes it's incredibly important and and i actually grew up if we're going to talk about where we where we've lived um i grew up in in what is now a tory seat um but i'm i'm also very very conscious of the fact that if you go to the south coast if you go to the south hamptons if you go to portsmouth plymouth all of that bit down there if you go down to the southwest if you look at who owned the southwest in 1997 if we're going to go back to 97 i feel like i missed out on that conversation here we go again you know it was susan's <laughs> party yeah. It wasn't mine and it wasn't mm. the Conservatives, but it was a very different picture. Now, that we had however, Labour MPs in Cornwall. We did forget. have exactly, <laughs> I was going to come on to that. We had a fantastic Labour MPs in the South West in seats that we no longer hold, but we are building up our capacity. And that's why I spent the day in Swindon yesterday. I'm actually most of the last few I'm obsessed weeks. obsessed with Swindon. I am obsessed with Swindon. I think Swindon, Swindon will become a light motif for the next general election. I really do. A bellwether, in fact. For me, it is a bellwether. Um, Kate Garraway has just texted me, our very good friend from Good Morning Britain. She says, just arrived at GMB. Can't believe you're still going. Sounding great. <laughs> Loving the show. Jackie doing well too. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Love you, Kate. Where's the solidarity? <laughs> I know, quite. Got she arrives at three o'clock for a six o'clock programme. Yeah. We turned up about two minutes beforehand, weren't we? <laughs> right, um, we are going to come to Susan Kramer in just a moment, but I first want to talk to Paul Bristow, the Conservative MP for Peterborough, who joins us. Uh, Paul, very good evening to you. Now, Peterborough has always been another one of these um, uh, bellwether uh, seats. Um, it, it was Labour in the Blair years, had a rather notorious MP, I seem to remember. Um, now, a third of your councillors were up for election. What happened tonight? Well, we, it's, uh, it's as we were. So we had 28 councillors uh, in Peterborough and we've still got 28. But we made a gain in my um, constituency. We, we won a seat of uh, Labour in Ravensthorpe, which is a very, you know, blue collar working uh, part of my city. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with the results. I think we had a great team. We had a good story to tell locally about uh, delivery. And in certainly in our blue uh, collar areas of Peterborough, our red wall areas of Peterborough, if you like, uh, not only did we um, we hold our own, we actually, our majorities increased and as I said, we made a gain. So I'm very happy with tonight. You haven't mentioned the fact that Labour also made a gain. Yes, yes they did. So they made a gain in uh, a different part of the city. Uh, but it, it, we were as we were. So I'm very, very happy with tonight. I think, you know, it's a reflection on all the hard work that we put into the campaign, but also a reflection uh, on the fact that Labour are not making the sort of strides that they need to... Uh, try and, and look like an alternative government. If you look at Ed Miliband, he made 857 uh, gains in 2011. Tony Blair made, I think, 2,000 gains in a similar midterm area. And it's always difficult uh, midterm. We've been in power 12 years, but Labour are not making the sort of breakthrough that they need if they were going to win the next election. And for people like me in a, in a, a bellwether seat, as you say, Ian, it's uh, good news, I think. Paul, you're talking about um, Conservative Party delivery. Um, to what extent on the doorstep were they talking about people delivering large 
numbers of bottles of wine into number 10 in suitcases and uh, the Prime Minister's inability to, to run number 10 in a sort of res responsible and respectable way. Did that come up? And what do you think your colleagues are going to be feeling about Boris Johnson's leadership tomorrow and next week if, as we're seeing in places like Wandsworth, the Conservatives might not actually be having that good an evening? Well, Boris Johnson has is the biggest electoral asset that this party has um, had, or the Conservative Party have had, in a generation. Uh, he's the only Prime Minister uh, to deliver a substantial majority since the majorities of Margaret Thatcher. I know we had a majority in 2015, but it was only a small one. So Boris Johnson is a proven electoral asset. He's never lost an election. And, uh, and, and so for me, speaking personally, I think um, we need to all get behind the Prime Minister, focus on delivery and, and, and do what needs to be done to make sure that um, we continue to deliver for the British people. So what I would say, that's my, would be my message to any Conservative colleague who um, uh, who would be wavering. But look, you know... Do you think there are some? Well, look, do you think there are some of your colleagues who are obviously, wavering? Look, obviously you've seen a, a number of MPs declare that they've sent letters to the 1922 committee, but they are a significant minority as far as I understand in the parliamentary party. Uh, we've made gains, as I say, across the country in uh, places and Labour are just not making that, that breakthrough. So I think that's what colleagues need to, uh, to focus on. Look, there's a lot to come because we're only halfway through this uh, electoral cycle. We've had a prime minister's had to deal with, got Brexit done, we had the, the COVID pandemic and now we've got a war in Ukraine and there's lots of delivery we need to get on with uh, for the British people and um, we need to get on with the job and that would be my message to everyone. But look, I don't think it's been, I don't think it's been a bad night for the Conservatives, especially after being in power for 12, year, 12 years and uh, we're in a mid-term situation so I, I, I'm still very positive. Paul, thank you very much indeed. That's Paul Bristow, the Conservative MP for Peterborough. None of you noticed I said good evening there, didn't I? It was only, it was only a matter of time. <laughs> Mary in Dartmouth says, this is the first time I haven't tuned into the BBC for election coverage. I stay awake for every election. I've been greatly enjoying the balance of information and humour. Well, the balance towards humour might, might ratchet up a little bit <laughs> over, the, over the next couple of hours. We might become punch drunk by six o'clock. If, if humour never know. Hyster hysterical laughter. Now, yeah. Susan Kramer, um, I feel guilty because we haven't come to you in this quarter yet. So It's um, not the humour you're coming to me. No, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Um, it, it, we've had three representatives from the Liberal Democrats. You're the third one tonight, um, all from South West London. Obviously a real Lib Dem stronghold. What, what... And also an easy place to get to your studio. Exactly. <laughs> you didn't have to say that. Um, so t tell us what, where, what, what should we be now looking for in um, Liberal Democrat uh, areas in South West London? Because Wimbledon um, that, that's a bit of a target for you in terms of a parliamentary seat, isn't it? We did really well there last time. So, I mean, that's an area that obviously we're going to look at. Uh, obviously, we want to hold the places that we have. It could be really interesting to take a look at the local elections because there's not there's not scope really to, to, to get, you know, a lot of additional seats when you mopped up as many as we did back in 2018. So I think a lot of our focus around this election campaign has been going beyond that South West corner of London, uh, you know, down to the south. That uh, we'll, be, we'll be watching Somerset to see where that goes. West Oxfordshire, that uh, uh, obviously Hull was really good news for us. But you can look in lots of seats where we seem to have made just maybe one or two or three gains. But that's enough to really begin to re-establish the party, particularly in areas where we once had quite a bit of depth. And it tells you that the party is refreshing. It's, it's becoming really embedded again in the local community and it's building that kind of strength. So I, I think though much of our focus will be in the blue wall seats because that's where when we talk to people, we have found they are so unrepresented. You know, it's not just Chesham and Amersham or North Shropshire. I was in shock going around some of those areas to find how little had been done. Not true as much in Chesham and Amersham, but certainly in North Shropshire. So I think a lot of the rural seats uh, uh, need another voice. Re really interesting result in Colchester. The Conservatives yep. down four on 19, Lib Dems up two on 14, Labour up two on 13, Greens up one on three, and the Independents down one on two. So... Apparently there's negotiations now going on for, to form an alliance between uh, Lib Dems, Labour and the Greens. I think it's been no overall control. Um, and that, that, of course, was a Liberal Democrat seat under Bob Russell, wasn't it? It so, was. But, yes, it I was. mean, up two seats, well, OK, great. But that also was a Lib Dem council not so long ago, I think. 
Well, again, you have to rebuild. I mean, you know, we we've been, we said we were looking for some sort of modest progress. It looks like we might be doing rather better than modest. But it, that's, the, that, that's the progress that we have to make. And you know our history, Ian. Once we begin to really get a hold in an area and people can actually see what Lib Dem councillors can do, or what Lib, uh, neighbouring uh, Lib Dem MPs can do, that, uh, and begin to really talk to the party's core values, fine, they share them. Uh, so so I, I expect to see this as part of that rebuild. Okay. And uh, I, I'm, you know, so far, fingers crossed. Well, I think the Lib Dems are certainly in a positive area in terms of extra councillors. Let, let, we'll have a tally up of uh, councils and councillors in just a moment for you. It's 19 minutes past three. This is LBC. Wait. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's 3.21 on LBC. Thangam Debonair is with us, Shadow Leader of the House of Commons and Labour MP for Bristol West, and Baroness Susan Kramer, Liberal Democrat peer, former MP for Richmond Park. Now, the we've got the total number of councillors, and actually, when you look at the total number, there is a hell of a long way to go, because there's 4,400 councillors being elected in England uh, today, or yesterday. Uh, Labour, so far, have built up 480. Uh, that's a plus one. So, so long it's pretty much go, a standstill. Ian, long way to go. Uh, well, it was it was minus fifteen yeah. earlier on. So, so net, we're ahead. So the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> incorrigible uh, conservatives two hundred and sixty one, which is down fifty three. I think they'd probably take that in some ways. Uh, Liberal Democrats a hundred. That's plus twenty seven. Independents thirty two plus which, three. Which, to be fair to the Lib Dems, can I just say, out of a hundred to be net yeah, yeah. plus twenty seven yeah. is quite impressive. <laughs> uh, Greens are they on twenty five? That's I can't read my writing. Is that plus eight, something like that? Plus 18. Plus 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, Residents Association, 19 plus four. In terms of councils, Labour are down one, Conservatives sort of stand still, and Lib Dems are gaining one. Now, Gareth, at this time of the morning, 3.22, I would have expected there to be more seats cool than this. Yeah, mm. some, count, some councils that normally count quite quickly seem to be going quite slowly. Uh, Wandsworth being an obvious example. Um, when you have quite tight elections, it does make things slower. People are a bit more diligent about um, the results. They don't tend to head to the bar in the count. Um, you know, more, more standing over there and mm. being a, do, doing the job <laughs> they're meant to be doing. Um, we will be getting more results through. I mean, it, you know, we're getting a steady stream all the time. It often does take quite a long time for those results to feed through as well. These are in um, you know, sometimes you know, business parks in far-flung places of boroughs. Um, takes a while for the results to come through. Certainly, the way things are going, you know, the London figures, I think, are going to be key. They're certainly going to be key from the media's point of view. They're the ones you're going to be reading the headlines about. Um, Barnet and Wandsworth are the two that we're particularly keeping an eye on at the moment. And in both of them, Labour are looking increasingly excited. Um, boundary changes does make it a little bit difficult to judge these things. Um, but the only, well, the the most significant shift of the evening, um, the Lib Dems getting an overall majority in Kingston-upon-Hull from no overall control. Um, 
we should tell people at this point in the evening what no overall control actually means. We should, shouldn't mm. we? Um, Why so, haven't you done it before? <laughs> so, <laughs> so when we, um, so if, for example, you have fifty councillors on a council, um, one party needs to get twenty-six in that case, just over fifty percent to have control of the council. However, if they have twenty-five it would be no overall control. They would have to come to some kind of agreement with someone else. And when I say they, that can be anyone. What you often tend to get is that parties that are traditionally in opposition in that council will band together. So that's where you get, for example, in South Oxfordshire a few years ago, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats getting together. Um, you will often find Labour and the Conservatives trying to get the Lib Dems out. I mean, you, it, all sorts of combinations. These arrangements can be very formal coalitions. They can just be... Um, agreements to to sit out on key votes on the budget, for example, all sorts of things like that. So no overall control actually hides no end of mm. different scenarios that we we, we won't find. Sorry, out. I've just slightly lost the will to live. Yeah, now. No, we, we, we tend <laughs> to do that this time of the evening. There'll be a prize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, new, news from Southampton: uh, nine of the sixteen wards have now been declared. The Tories have lost three seats: two to Labour, one to the Lib Dems, and that was their majority. So we'll keep a close eye on that. Now, the battle for the Wirral hasn't had a winner, and the council is one of those under no overall control still. But it's been a good outcome for the Greens. Liam Thorpe is the political editor for the Liverpool Echo, and he joins me now. Uh, Liam, very good morning. I nearly said it. Good morning to you. Um, take us through what's happening on the Wirral. Hi, Ian. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm about four or five cans of uh, Red Bull down, so I'm glad you clarified <laughs> it. Was, uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you clarified it was the morning because I've lost all sense of time and, and space. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the most interesting. Um, council for us was always going to be the Wirral and it's it really is something of a, a bellwether in, in a lot of elections both um, in, in terms of general elections and the national picture with local elections um, and it's it's been a pretty rough night for Labour here they they went they lost their majority on the council back in 2019 going into no overall control but running a, a slender minority uh, administration they then went backwards further last year and they were hoping to kind of have a little bit of a resurgence this year but they've actually lost further seats and it's 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 the greens that have really done the damage here so the tories went into this one only four seats off um labor but they only managed to gain one but it's the greens actually that took that did the most damage they, they've they've had a bit of a resurgence in Wirral recently um and they gained two seats from from labor so labor at the end of tonight, are now down to uh, to leading a no overall c control council by just one seat. So it's it's about as precarious as it can get, really. And mm. as your correspondent just said, it's it, it doesn't necessarily we don't necessarily know what's going to happen there. But they've got a committee system. So what they generally have is a, a cross party cabinet with uh, with a minority a minority leadership. And it, I imagine that will still be Labour leading, but by just one seat. So it's it's been a tough night for them, but they're just about clinging on. And what's caused that? Is it the backwash from all the scandals associated with neighbouring Liverpool City Council? I, I don't think so. I mean, Wirral Council have actually had their own their own issues. They've just not been as well as well documented right. or publicised as Liverpool. They've they've had financial issues. They've also had an intervention by the government. They've just had to sign off twenty million pounds of, of further cuts, which the, the Labour Party would argue is is, is being foisted on them time and time again by the Conservatives. The Conservative government have said it's been mismanagement. And the Greens, seemingly, are the kind of the ones who've come through the middle and, and profited from all of this. The Greens were the only ones who didn't back um, the, the, the cuts budget. And they've really kind of dined out on that and said, look, we, we are the alternative. So that, like with a lot of these things, Ian, I think people tr will try and read other stuff into it. But often it really it can be down to local issues. And these are, these are uh, key local issues for people. People don't want more cuts. People don't think the council necessarily been run particularly well. Um, and, and they've made their voices clear. You, you've done some brilliant journalism on what's gone on in Liverpool. Um, what, what about, what's happening there on the council now, and in, in particular on elections? It, well, that's very kind of you, and thank you. Um, so a lot of people were, were messaging me today saying, hold on, why have I got no polling card in Liverpool? Um, and I have, I have tried to explain quite often um, uh, recently that Liverpool was not voting today because the, the scandals that happened last year, the, the historically bad and damning inspection report that led to government intervention, that means that we've got a team of commissioners now in place at Liverpool trying to kind of undo a lot of the, the damage of the past five years or so. I mean, one of the big fallouts from that is that we've completely changed our electoral system here in Liverpool. Rather than the old system of, of electing a third of councillors every three or four years, we're now moving to all-out elections once every four years, and they will start next May. So 
while there's been <laughs> there's been a uh, sort of a notable absentee in Liverpool this year, we'll be back with a bang next year and I imagine there'll be mm. plenty of chaos and drama to come. Liam, thanks very much for joining us. That's Liam Thorpe, the political editor of the Liverpool Echo. Well, you know, we have some fantastic local journalists in this country and they don't get yeah. the recognition. I mean, Liam in sure. Liverpool, you've got Jennifer yeah. Williams, who up until recently was um, from the Manchester Evening News. I'm sure you've got some brilliant ones in Bristol as well, thank you. And, and they, de- they don't get the praise that they deserve. And if it wasn't for people like Liam Thorpe, we wouldn't know about all of these scandals well, in, in mm, Liverpool, would mm, we? Mm. Th- this, this also... Um, Susan, let's come to you on this. Th- this idea that we should now be moving from re- electing a third of councillors each year to all-out elections, that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Because that gives the electorate the, cha- the chance to actually change a council. Whereas often when you're electing only a third each year, you can't. It's, all, it's the status quo. I mean, I see the argument that you're making. I, I, I'm actually personally quite neutral on, on this one. I think the issue is PR Typical rather than down. first the past fence. the post. Well, on that issue. <laughs> but I don't sit on the fence on uh, going for a proportional representation. Oh, really? I think, yeah, uh, as you know. <laughs> and, uh, because that would let people really go out and vote for the party that they want instead of, you know, the do-it-yourself sort of uh, tactical voting that, uh, that, uh, that I think does does frustrate a whole lot of people and reduces participation, frankly, that's uh, um, in politics. Uh, I'm, what I'm always afraid of with something like like an all-up uh, is that one issue, a national issue, for example, will suddenly capture the attention and inst- with a local election, you'll actually you'll get a national verdict rather than a local verdict. And I really do think local politics is at its best when it's really genuinely structured around the local community. It's the voice of the community. It's dealing with those communities' issues. So that's my concern sometimes when you can turn it all over because you suddenly look at the government of the day and think, I hate those people. Or you look at the opposition of the day and think, I hate those people at national level. uh, So that's what worries me. That's my concern there. The, the interesting thing, I mean, as Liam says, the reason why they've got uh, all-out elections in Liverpool was as a result of the intervention by government and, and bringing in of commissioners following the, the, the scandal, really, of what was going on in Liverpool. Similarly, in Birmingham, slightly less scandalous, but also commissioners caused them to change their their electoral system to one where they have all-out elections, which they've actually had today. So there has been voting in Birmingham today, and those results will come tomorrow. In my constituency, which, remember, was a very marginal constituency, we had votes every year. So we had a third uh, for three years and then another election in the fourth year. Actually, that was really important for me as a marginal CMP, because what it meant was every year, councillors, along with me and my team, were out knocking on doors, getting the sort of data that you need in order to run an election campaign in a really marginal seat. And this was the point I think Gareth was making earlier about people need councillors in order, MPs quite often want to have councillors in order to support them in their Mm. uh, campaigning. And I think you, Susan, said earlier on, you know, once you start building up councillors, you start building up political momentum, you've got that cadre of activists that will make a difference. Well, that's how became successful, didn't they, in the 80s and 90s? Yes. I mean, we grew out of a very, but also out of a very strong passion for, you know, sending power back to local communities, sending decision-making back towards local communities. Until you became fans of the EU, then you wanted to send it up there. Ah, excuse me. Oh, shall we? Let's not open that. Let's Anyway, let's go to the news headlines. At 3.32 with Alice Bell. (laughs) The Conservative Party faces losing control of a flagship London authority to Labour. Wandsworth, which has been a Conservative authority for more than 40 years, looks set to fall to them. Council seats are up for grabs in Scotland, Wales and many parts of England, while there's also elections in Northern Ireland. Another effort is underway to evacuate civilians from the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol, which is close to being captured by Russian forces. The United Nations 
Commission says it won't go into detail to avoid undermining the operation. Oxford University has announced a fully funded scholarship scheme for Ukrainian refugees. It will begin in the next academic year and will support highly qualified graduates from Ukraine whose lives have been disrupted by the ongoing conflicts. LBC weather, cloudy for Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight, mostly dry for England and Wales, a low of 8 degrees. This is LBC. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Text 84850. 3.35, Susan Kramer with us from the Liberal Democrats. Dangam Debonair, Shadow Leader of the House of Commons Labour MP for Bristol West. James says, I hear Hillingdon is looking good for Labour. Mm. Surely personally embarrassing for the PM if the Tories lose control of the council. That's from James. Um, uh, Labour are claiming that they would be winning 10 Leave voting general election seats uh, based on the aggregate vote share. They would be Carlisle, Copeland, Great Grimsby, Hartlepool, Lee, Lincoln, Southport, Thurrock, West Bromwich West, Workington. They need to lead they need to win a lot more than 10, wouldn't they, Ben Kentish? Yes, they would. They need to win about 120. But it is interesting, Ian. We were talking, Tangham was talking about a little bit before about some of the areas that Labour needs to win. We talk a lot, don't we? It's become almost a cliche of the Red Wall. Scotland is absolutely crucial. Yeah. But it's not just the North. It's not just Scotland. There are towns in the South of England yeah. that Labour won in 1997, won in 2001. And to get close to Downing Street, Keir Starmer needs to win again. Towns like Stevenage, towns like Harlow, Crawley, Dover. Swindon. South Swindon. Hampton, Swindon. <laughs> And yet, yes. when you look at some of the towns that Labour have gained seats from the Tories tonight, Ian, Crawley, Harlow, Dover, Stevenage, it looks set like they might take control of Southampton Council. Those are exactly the sorts of, mostly towns, uh, that they need to win back to, to win, have any chance of winning the next general election. And it looks like limited, OK, it's, it's small numbers, it's early days, but they are making some inroads, and that will be a boost to Keir Starmer, even if it seems like in, in parts of the north of England, northwest particularly, he's not seeing quite the results he wanted. Another bit of news in, in for you on Barnet, two absolutely crucial wards in that borough, High Barnet and Whetstone. Labour hoped to win High Barnet, they had audacious hopes, frankly, of winning Whetstone. They've swept them both. Uh, easy wins for both uh, for Labour candidates in both wards and I think it's pretty fair to say given those two results that it's very very difficult to see anything other than Labour winning Barnet tonight. Um, we, we, I want to have a word about election counts because oh. apart, apart from you Ben, <laughs> uh, Gareth have you ever been a candidate of any description? Yeah I've been a candidate. So you, you not, not a parliamentary one though? No, no I've been well, an agent, I've been, I've been in many many elections. Oh counts. well that, mm. the agent, oh, the joy, the joy. The agent's yeah. role as a count. Yeah. I think this might be quite fertile territory so let, let's have <laughs> yes. a little bit of reminiscing about what it's like to be at an election count. Now Thank you. Did you lose an election before you won? I, I stood for Bristol City Council in 12 and I did not win. So we've all had experience mm. of losing at a Sadly, count. yes. Yeah. And it's, and it, it's, it it's, it's a horrible, horrible experience, isn't it? It's character forming. 
Because I nearly got in a fight. Did you? Oh, I did. My very first election, council election, I fought. Uh, <laughs> Literally. Uh, yes, almost. Um, and I lost in my seat by by fewer votes than the anti-poll tax union gained, which tells you how long ago it was. Oh. So I'm afraid I was young and hot-headed in those days. And I did slightly... No, no, you're just old and hot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I slightly approached the uh, I approached the anti poll tax union candidate to point out to him that had he not stood we would have taken this seat from the How did you point it out to him? I pointed it out robustly <laughs> to him. and uh, on that particular occasion the role of the agent which I actually think was Mike Foster who went on to be the uh, to be the MP for Worcester was to drag me away <laughs> shouting I'll have him I'll have him all. <laughs> What F's and C's used? I, they may well have been. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever got into a fight at well, a camp? I've never stood as a young hothead. <laughs> oh, only as uh, much more stayed, much less likely to want to get into a scrap at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, all of the counts I've been involved in, they've always gone on for what feels like forever. <laughs> um, in 2015, that kind of worked for me because I did take a seat off the Lib Dems. And by the time the seat was declared, for various reasons, um, it was seven o'clock in the morning, the birds were tweeting and it yeah. was my mother's birthday. But all the journalists who'd come from all the other counts <laughs> in the region, they were all at my count. So I got a nice reception. It was very exciting for me. Me. Um, but, you know, it was very early in the morning and I was quite tired and I wanted to go to bed. Well, I have two memories from my count in 2005 in North Norfolk where I turned a 483 Lib Dem majority into a 10,600 majority <laughs> for the Lib Dems. Quite a talent, that, isn't it? Would you care to run again? <laughs> well, of course, if I had run in 2019, I would have won because the, the seat was won back then. But I, I remember... I had this sort of, in 2005, mobile technology wasn't very hot, but I had this little mobile television because I wanted to follow things. Of course you did. And I remember <laughs> watch, sitting on a, it was in a school sports hall in Cromer, and I remember sitting on a bench, and I had this thing in my hands, and I was just looking at it, and then there was a clown on stilts who was a, a, a candidate. <laughs> he came over and put his hand around my arm and he was watching it too. The headline in the Eastern Daily Press the next day was Clown Consoles Losing Tory Candidate. <laughs> <laughs> and then my, my main thing was, because uh, I, I, I knew I was going to lose, I didn't quite realise the extent to which I was going to lose. Yeah. And my, because Jackie will confirm that I will cry at anything. <laughs> and I, my main mission was not to cry when making yeah. the concession yeah. speech. It's important. Yeah. And I Dignity. thought, right, I can't look at any of my party workers, I just can't look at anyone. And I think I gave, I wish I'd got a re record of it, I, one of the finest speeches I've ever given. <laughs> And then Norman Lamb, who was the yeah, guy that beat me, yeah. he then ruined it all by coming up and squeezing my arm. <laughs> Were you, did you go? I think I did go a little bit. Mm. And then the next day, it was the county council election count, which I didn't have to go to, but I thought, no, I'm going to show my face. And I walked into the hall and everybody, even the Liberal Democrats, clapped me. Oh, that meant quite that's a lot. heartwarming. Yeah. Susan, have you got an equally <laughs> heartwarming story? No, no, they're not really heartwarming stories. I mean, when you win, it's all relatively easy and lovely and whatever else. It's when you lose... Mm. You, you stand there and you know you you've got to, you got you want to make the best speech of your life and mm. that means you know, let me show you what you're missing <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, thank you so much for you know the privilege of having been here and why did you throw me out uh, so, but, um, but, but, but you look at your own team and you suddenly realize they're yeah. starting to mm. absolutely dissolve yeah and somehow because they you've have got devoted to hours to trying to get you well, elected. And your whole thing is, you know, it's my fault. It's not their fault. Well, it's, uh, um, so you're trying desperately to help them hold it together. Mm. And uh, that's, what, that's when you realise, I think, how much people have invested yeah, yeah. of themselves in you to get you to win. I mean, it's, it's rather shattering. I'm glad I didn't in a sense, take it fully on board beforehand. I think it would have made the pressure of running far and harder. the most awful thing was, I can remember, as I left the building with my partner, got in the car, and we had to go to the post-count party. Oh. I mean, that I just did not want to do. And I, I can just remember getting into the car, and we were in total silence, because, I mean, I, I was shell-shocked. And you're going to have to take over, because I'm getting mad. Oh. Oh, he's off. So, 
And that, I mean, I was just thinking, Susan, about when I lost in 2010, which, of course, in one way I knew I was going to lose. But, of course, given everything that had gone before, there was a considerable amount of media interest, both in the room just and... remind us, I can't yeah, remember. Thanks. Yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and exactly as you say, I really wanted to make sure that I was dignified because yeah. the very worst thing that happens yeah. when somebody loses uh, an election is when they make a really sort of yeah. undignified James yeah. Goldsmith sort of... Yeah. And it um, gets played over and over. Yeah, again. yeah. And, and it never goes away. Exactly. Yeah. You have got to recognise that democracy involves people losing mm. when they hope they're going to win as yeah. well as winning. Um, and you've got to be dignified about yeah. it. But it is not always... Easy. I mean, as well as the volunteers, I think, I, may I put in a plea for, for sort of feelings for staff? Because yeah. MP staff, yep. when the MP mm. loses, that's it. They're unemployed mm. right there, yeah. right then. And it's it's horrible. Do but you find out before you go on the stage? When yes. You, well, just, so they tell you just, just before, yeah. so Moments you have to before. stand there, so Moments wondering before. whether you've yeah. got a victory or a No, it's success. not. It was worse on Strictly, because yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, no, I, 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 <laughs> you, you get told I you don't know. Oh, you don't know. But Gareth, you and and I have both been agents at elections and I was the agent on the Isle of Dogs by-election where the BMP won a council seat and that, that was quite an experience. But what is the role of a party agent at a count? So a party agent is there primarily to um, look after the candidates, especially at a general election in a marginal constituency. Um, candidates are nervous to say the least. Um, but the, the main jobs that they're to do, they're, they're there to sort of manage the volunteers. The volunteers are getting samples of ballot boxes that are going to be useful for future elections. The political parties actually work together on a lot of that. Um, there's quite a lot mm. of cooperation on polling day between the political parties. Um, they're there to scrutinise the ballot papers as well, um, generally to tell the counting agents, you know, the actual people counting, um, you know, not to fold ballot papers and do all sorts of things. Um, the atmosphere at most election counts is OK, but I mean, my count, story. So in 2005, um, I managed to go to three election counts and lose all of them. Um, we managed to have two recounts in the first place, a candidate extremely upset. Um, and someone said to me, oh, you know, we, can we jump in the car and go to another count? So we went there where they were on their fourth recount, <gasps> where there was, we had to physically restrain the two candidates that were fighting over the recount. Ouch. All the numbers had been changing as well physically restrained to keep them separate um, and in the end I'm, I'm sorry you had to do that for me but... <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in, in the end yeah we had to make a decision to call that one jumped in the car was was in the car park of the third place when they called called and said yeah that this one's already gone um, do you want to go to the Isle of Wight was the was the next <laughs> one at that point we, at that point we just said no um, so that was three in one evening but some counts they do get very very raucous yeah. I mean I've you know, in in um, London Borough of Newham um, Tower Hamlets I mean, I mean if you speak to anyone that's ever been to a count in Tower Hamlets yeah. they will give you legendary hours of stories about it it mm. is horrific absolutely horrific um, because a lot of these counts take place in really pokey little rooms and there's ballot papers flying all over the place you've got a big sports hall everything's generally okay but lots of tired people yeah lots everybody's of been everybody's been working their socks off yeah. in the weeks in the run-up to the election day they've been working all day on the election day occasionally drink gets taken when it shouldn't be and the whole thing becomes very very tense and passionate would be a nice way of putting and, it. And the most common fights that I've seen, the, the things that we've had to separate people on, don't tend to be party versus party. It tends to be, for example, parliamentary candidates versus council leader. Mm. Or, yeah, it, 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 is, it is people looking for people to blame. You're laughing a bit too hard there. So. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, you, you often see the, the internal party divisions from all parties tend to go on display and right. it's it's certainly interesting to watch. Um, we've got a few results. We'll bring them to you in just a second. It's 3.47. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Millions went to the polls across the United Kingdom to cast their votes in the local election. With the Prime Minister plagued by negative headlines, did it turn out to be a piece of cake for Boris Johnson? I've received a fixed penalty notice from the Metropolitan Police relating to an event. I once again offer a full apology. And has Beergate meant it all went flat for Sir Keir Starmer's chances? We were in the office, we were working, we stopped to have something to eat. There was no party, there was no breach of the rules. Join me, Nick Ferrari, for a specially extended local election special from 6am as all the results 
and your reactions come in. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. I've never... Leading Britain's conversation, LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. A terrific candidate. It's 3.49 on LBC. Um, Susan Crame is trying to interrupt me as I introduce <laughs> the rest of the programme. Thank you, Susan. Um, we have a result for a couple of Midlands results to talk about, and then we'll come on to some in London. Um, in Dudley... Uh, Upper Gornal and Wood Sutton. Labour have gained a seat from the Conservatives. That's not the first gain in Dudley, I think, tonight. And the Labour leader of Merton... Cam uh, sorry, uh, in Worcester, um, the... Conservatives have lost that. It's gone off my screen now. Quite no, I don't it's know why. Was it Conservative control to no overall control? And Worcester was one of those seats, along with Redditch, my constituency, and at the time Wire Forest, that was part of the 1997 landslide. It was lost in 2010, and is one of those seats that needs to be won again in order uh, for there to be a Labour government. It's also had um, uh, Labour councils. I, I'm, I forget when the most recent time was that they've had it, but that's that's quite a significant shift, and that's the place where the Conservative leader uh, slightly flounced out, and apparently has suggested that uh, that it's because the electors of Worcester have found the um, government's performance wanting. So this is another Conservative local government leader who is criticising mm. the National Party, and I suspect particularly Boris Johnson. And in the London borough of Merton, the Labour leader has lost his seat to the Lib Dems, but ironically, the other seat in his ward was still held by Labour. <laughs> um, and Susan, you've got some interesting news from Barnes. Oh, yes. Well, this is in the constituency of Richmond, so I don't think that's been called uh, overall, but... Barnes was the where I live is the only uh, um, was the only ward where the Conservatives held all Quite three posh, isn't seats. It, Barnes? it is a posh area. We we have people who are not posh, and it's actually a hard place to live in a sense if you're not posh. And the council <laughs> is brilliant about providing support to that community, which I suspect is one of the reasons why 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 why, why we got the result. But we've taken the Lib Dems have taken all three seats, and it's only that I sat telling today, and I have to say that the other teller for the Conservatives Conservatives were so completely confident that, that we shouldn't even have bothered to stand there that, uh, um, that I take some satisfaction. But also, do you know what I've said to you before about the Lib Dems rebuilding and a lot of new blood coming in? All those three new councillors are people who weren't engaged in politics four or five years ago, completely new to it, bring a lot of world experience, but they're part of this rebuilding and their passion for the community. I think the three of them probably have talked to at least 60% of the uh, ward's population. They're so determined to, to, to do it right for the local people. Ben. 
It's an interesting result, though, in the very leafy, wealthy part of South London. Lib Dems look like they're gaining significant ground in those sorts of areas. And as we were talking about before, this is the risk for the Tories, is that actually it's not the, the seats that they were fending off Labour that they seem to be struggling most, although they have made losses there. It's the seats in the, the southeast and parts of the southwest where the Lib Dems seem to be the main challengers. And actually, if you go into who the sort of Surrey MPs are not too far down the road. You, if you're Dominic Raab and you're looking at majority uh, in Esher and Morton and you're looking at what's going on in places like Richmond and Twickenham and Merton, you're pretty worried. There's quite a lot of big hitter Tory MPs down in uh, neighbouring Surrey. You've got Michael Gove, Quasi Kwarteng, Jeremy Hunt. They're going to be looking, and some of those have got pretty big majority. Michael mm. Gove's about 14,000. They're going to be looking at these sorts of results in places like Barnes and thinking, do I need to be worried? Gareth, what, what's your interpretation of these results we just read out? Maybe you've got some more. Um, so, first of all, um, Barnett, um, yeah, the, the marginal wards there are going Labour. Um, I, th I wouldn't necessarily say it's safe to say it's Labour yet, but I think I'd be pretty pretty confident on that. And the same goes for Wandsworth as well. Um, there's still plenty of results to come in. Uh, in terms of Tory wipeouts, um, Richmond is big. I mean, this is big. This was a Conservative um, borough um, very recently, a um, very strong Conservative borough as well. Um, to lose all their seats is, is big news, and we should be looking at other areas where this could happen as well. Ealing, for example. Um, the Tories controlled Ealing until relatively recently. Um, we haven't. You know, we've been very focused on a couple of boroughs in London, but you know, as, as we look a bit more, a bit more widely, um, I think that you know there's some pretty bad results out there for the Conservatives yet to come. Um, the you know, we've got to remember a lot of these London boroughs are pretty historically conservative. Redbridge, for example, Enfield, we we did mention. Um, Brent was always a borough that they were you know, always interested in. Um, the Tories nearly took control of Brent in the nineties. Um, none of this, yeah, you know, this is all pie in the sky stuff at the moment, you know, when they're looking at being wiped out in Richmond. Because it's interesting, last year, Sean Bailey, the Tory mayoral candidate, did much better than anybody thought he would. He ended up with 45% of the vote against Sadiq Khan. And I, I wondered whether that might be reflected in, in the results today, but it doesn't seem to have been at all. I think turnout's a big factor. I, I've seen <coughs> turnout figures of 20 to 25%, pretty much everywhere across the country. With the Sean Bailey versus Sadiq Khan election, you, at least you had um, personalities that were driving turnout up a little bit. And yeah, that would suggest that yeah, people thought that... I mean, I don't, know, I don't know anyone that thought Sean Bailey was going to win that election. I think everyone was a little bit taken aback by how well he did. Um, but I think turnout is a big factor there. I think that what we're seeing is a real pattern of Conservative voters staying at home. And they don't need to stay at home in big numbers to cause real damage to the party in London. Um, and... You know, is, is it necessarily healthy for the Liberal Democrats potentially to have every single councillor in Richmond? No. I think we'd all agree a 100% council for any political party is not necessarily a good thing. So it'll be interesting to see if the Greens can pick up a few seats from the Lib Dems in Richmond. I think that's possible. We spoke about that earlier. Um, but, you know, there's certainly, there's certainly some interesting results to come. Yeah, I think it's inevitable that there will be at least one Green because in one ward we only stood two Liberal Democrat candidates. Oh, another pact. Uh, no pact. <laughs> so. Well, there clearly is, if you didn't stand in all three and let the Green win. Well, you, you can't tell your people how to vote. No, why didn't you stand three uh, candidates so, then? Uh, so, uh, it was a local decision that that's what they wanted to do. We leave it very much to each local ward to decide how it wants to do these kinds of things. Uh, to be fair, so sometimes, sometimes you, you have can't... close working relationships. And sometimes you can't the find the candidates. Yes, yes. Mm. <laughs> to be fair. It's a yeah. tough gig being, yeah. a, being a council candidate, especially in a seat where you don't think you're going to win. I mean, I've supported people who are doing solid work, you know, knocking on doors and, and, and doing all the work and actually knowing that they're not going to win or thinking that they might win and then they don't win. It is a really tough gig. Mm. So, you know, I think that earlier on we were talking about an, an area where someone hadn't got a Labour leaflet, for instance, and I think, well, mm. we have to prioritise our resources Courses. Most people, I think, think we've got vast quantities of paid stuff, which is just simply not true. Most elections are trodden around the streets by volunteers. It's hard work. By the way, letterboxes. Please, can we do something about letterboxes? Yeah. Because oh. letterboxes do really unkind things to your hands in election oh. periods. I think the Liberal Democrats had some parliamentary motion on letterboxes oh. recently. We, we have a wonderful soft.
song Was about letterboxes because anyone who like delivers these regular <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to sing it. No, I do. Close down your program. <laughs> so, no, but the way it sort of sniffy snaps at your fingers. Oh, they're horrid. Oh, yeah. Especially if they do that and it's very low. So you yes. yeah. shouldn't be allowed to be down <laughs> there. It should not be no. allowed. And then when they snippy snap and then when there's a dog as well. It's oh, yeah. like a triple whammy. It's awful. Grow up. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> I bet you didn't group. like them either. No, I didn't like them either. Thank you. <laughs> I, I like them sort of about... I, I like those doors where they're, they're quite... Well, the, there's a, w a square window at the top, uh -huh. and then the letterbox is straight yeah, under perfect. the window. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's only it can only be improved by someone answering the door and going, "Yes, of course, I'm voting Labour." Off you go. I mean, that was the, <laughs> that's only, my the only reason I thought that the sale of council houses was wrong, because it meant that people put all these fancy doors on there, or was the council provided ones were actually at a reasonable height, weren't they? Very reasonable oh. height. My favourite one was when uh, a householder sent out their dog to collect the leaflet and it was one of these wonderful you know Labradors with a lovely soft mouth you tell she and it stood there. Area, as, opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to sending out their dog to, to bite you and, yes. <laughs> and of all election yeah. Yeah. recently we were chased away so by dogs Tyson go <laughs> can I just report on the earlier excitement that we had around can the, you do it uh, within a minute yes I can uh, on the Bristol mayoral uh, model yes. Bristol has voted to scrap the Hasn't mayoral him. model mm. yeah Paul Marvin Oh, he stays. No, he stays. stays. And he's yeah. already said he's standing down. Said that last year. Sorry, someone is saying something in my ear which I couldn't hear a word of. So, Sorry. anyway, never mind. Um, we are going to. Oh, we have Royston Smith, uh, Conservative MP for Southampton, itching on the line. That was what somebody was saying in my ear. Uh, Royston, very good evening to you. Now, the last time we heard about the Southampton count, I think nine of 16 seats had declared, and there were three that the Conservatives had lost, and that was the Conservative majority gone. Can you update us? Uh, yes, and that's about the uh, size of it. I think it's four now, and um, there's another one, I think, maybe two to declare, but um, numerically that doesn't come back now, so I think we can safely say that um, Southampton has uh, is now run by Labour. Uh, and that must be obviously very concerning for you because Southampton is one of these uh, cities that uh, if there's a Labour government probably most of the seats in, in the city are Labour, and yet the Conservatives have done quite well in Southampton in recent years. Is, is there other demographic changes, or is it just a case of um, people either don't like the way the council's being run, or they don't like the way the national government is being run? Oh, my, you know, I'll have to unpick that a bit. I mean... <laughs> I don't think it's. I don't think it's what the, the council has done. Yeah, they've been here for a year and they've done. They've done an awful lot in that year. Um, some of which won't even be noticed. You know, like signing up some some good um, developments in Southampton, which will you know be beneficial in, in in years to come. So I don't think it's that. I do think there's an element of giving the government a kicking when people are concerned and they have a lot of concerns. The Cost of living is really starting to bite. Inflation's going up. Pay doesn't keep up with that. Fuel prices, energy prices. People are worried, and they look to the government to sort that out. And in these, uh, you know, it's 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 well, you, Ian, you've been around a long time. That you know, it's normally the local councils that bear the brunt when um, people are concerned about the government, and the government have got a challenge on their hands. Royston, sorry, it's so brief, but we've got to go. Thank you very much. That's Royston Smith, Conservative MP for Southampton, Itchen. It's one minute past four. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at four o'clock, the Conservative Party is braced for losses in London as the first votes are counted after local elections across the UK. There'll be declarations overnight in some contests in England, but that won't happen until tomorrow in Scotland and Wales. In Sunderland, Labour has managed to retain control of the council. Its leader, leader Graham Miller, says he's hopeful the work they've done will get them the results they're aiming for. On a local level, our message is cutting through and, and that's why our vote is increasing. And nationally, the party are beginning to see that there is an alternative. Keir Starmer's done a brilliant job of building trust with the people to show that we genuinely are trying to help them through the cost of living crisis. 
The Tories face losing control of Wandsworth after more than 40 years, but Conservative MP for Peterborough, Paul Bristow, has told LBC he's still proud of the work his party has done. We've had a Prime Minister's had to deal with, got Brexit done, we had the, the Covid pandemic and now we've got a war in Ukraine and there's lots of delivery we need to get on with for the British people and um, we need to get on with the job and that would be my message to everyone. I don't think it's been a bad night for the Conservatives, especially after being in power for 12, year, 12 years and uh, we're in a mid-term situation. So I, I, I'm still very positive. In Northern Ireland, voters have been choosing the next batch of Assembly members. Another effort is underway to evacuate civilians from the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol, which is close to being captured by Russian forces. The United Nations says it won't go into detail to avoid undermining the operation. Hundreds of people are trapped out of steelworks where Ukrainian soldiers are resisting. Retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell says they're becoming national heroes. They're buying time for their compatriots because the longer the soldiers are tied up around Mariupol, uh, the Russian soldiers can't go and fight the Ukrainian colleagues up in the Donbass. So a true inspirational effort, even if ultimately Mariupol does fall. Oxford University has announced a fully funded scholarship scheme for Ukrainian refugees. It will begin in the next academic year and will support highly qualified graduates from Ukraine whose lives have been disrupted by the ongoing conflicts. And more than half of people who still use cash say it helps them keep track of their spending. The consumer group Which asked 4,000 people about their use of money. LBC weather, rain across Northern Ireland and Scotland later this morning. Mostly warm, sunny spells for England and Wales with highs of 21 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Alice Bell. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. It's four minutes past four on LBC. Welcome to the programme. Jackie Smith is eating a pack of crisps. That is the breaking news on LBC. Now, I have an apology to make because many people will be tuning into LBC at this moment because it is the 4am spike. Do we all know what the 4am spike is? It's all linked to Steve Allen. It's it? all linked to Steve Allen, who would normally be on LBC at this point. Um, but And there'll be a lot of... Steve Allen devotees who won't be very pleased that you and I are here, Jackie. But I am going to make it up to you because this very morning I recorded a two-hour podcast with Steve Allen where I interviewed him about his life, career and all sorts of things. And you will absolutely love it if you are a Steve devotee, which I know uh, many of you are who are tuning in at the moment. But stay with us because we're, we, we can mix it up, can't we, Jackie? In a sort of Steve Allen fashion. Yeah. What, what's your view on Peter Andre? Um, <laughs> I'm slightly more Team Katie than I am oh, yeah. Team Peter. Okay, that's yeah. enough. <laughs> um, and I should tell you, Jackie Smith, that you have gone viral. The LBC digital people have been working their magic and they've put out... Uh, here we are. Former Labour Home Secretary Jackie Smith recalls how she almost got into a fight after losing in a council election. <laughs> so that will make you even more famous than you are already. <laughs> now, Theo Usherwood, our political editor, has joined us. And I should at this point apologise also for not saying goodbye because we slightly ran out of time to thank him, Debonair, Ben Kentish and Susan Kramer. Uh, we had a great hour with them and Ben was here for, what, six hours? Yes, he was. Yeah, I mean, slacker. Slacker, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he's still, you see, he can still be here. He's, he's watching us now. And we also have Suzanne Evans with us, uh, Director of the Public Affairs Consultancy, Political Insight, and former, de former Deputy Chairman of UKIP. And Gareth Knight is with us as well. Now, I think probably with two hours to go, Gareth, it's a good idea if we just recap on where we are. The sort of the number of councillors that have been elected, the number of uh, councils that have changed hands. So we've had, um, the current score is 51 out of 146 um, councils have declared in England because Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland um, all counting tomorrow. Um, as things stand, Labour have 684 of those councillors that have declared. The Conservatives 337. Now, that means Labour have only gained 15 and the Conservatives have lost 73. So it's not exactly earth-shattering figures at the moment. But the thing that we've been picking up all evening is where those um, 
where some of these changes have taken place. And certainly Labour are doing very well in London. The Conservatives actually really not doing badly in the north of England. Um, the Liberal Democrats having a very good evening. Um, 129 councillors so far, but up 32, which is a decent return for them. And the Greens proportionally having an amazing evening, um, up 18 to 25. Obviously, that is proportionally. But when we look at some of the detail of the figures, we can see the Greens doing much, much better than people would have expected. In terms of actual councils, Labour have lost one, the Conservatives have lost one, the Liberal Democrats have gained one, which was Kingston-upon-Hull. Um, there's a lot of no overall control shenanigans that will be going on, different coalitions over the next few days. So the, the control of your council may have changed, but at the moment, um, in terms of actual majorities, the only real difference is the Liberal Democrats um, gaining Kingston upon Hull. Now, Theo, I don't know what time you got up, but um, just tell us, give us your interpretation of the results so far. Well, there's a bit of breaking news Good. to we start like off with. Um, is Labour are looking like they're, they're calling it for Wandsworth. They think they're going to win Wandsworth. Uh, Labour source saying Boris Johnson uh, losing Wandsworth is monumental. This was the Tories' jewel in the crown. Voters in Wandsworth have put their trust in the change Keir, Starmer, Keir Starmer's Labour represents. And, of course, Wandsworth, and you'll be able to tell me about this, is was Margaret Thatcher's uh, favourite council. This was the uh, one that she was... She, I'm not sure she ever said that. No. But people have seen that. And, and, and so, uh, the, the, you know, Labour taking Wandsworth and, of course, taking Barnett as well, that, 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 that is, that's, a, that's a big result mm. for... Um, uh, that's a big result for Keir Starmer and, and it's, a, of course, a significant loss for um, the Prime Minister. Outside of London, it's looking like it's been a very good night for... Um, the Liberal Democrats, it also looks like they're going to be taking uh, Merton as well. Um, but not necessarily, uh, you know, and the Tories are, and everybody's spinning like mad at the moment, but not necessarily um, the, the, the heavy uh, losses um, uh, that, that perhaps uh, the Conservatives were fearing and could have put a real dent in, uh, put a real dent in the Prime Minister's hopes of continuing. Were they actually fearing it or were they managing expectations when there was this talk about losing 800 seats and um, it, 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 are they now in a yeah, position course. where they're saying well it's not quite as bad as we thought it was going to be so therefore it's a victory yeah precisely I mean that's that's you you go down don't you in your expectations you say you go down you say you go to the worst possible scenario of what how it will be and then when you get to the actual results you get to periods like this you can actually say well Look, this is what we said a couple of weeks ago. This is how bad we feared it was going to be. And you had all of those local, you had all those local candidates putting out leaflets saying, "Don't punish us. Uh, we're local Conservatives. We've got nothing mm. to do with uh, the Prime Minister and Party Gate in Westminster. We represent you on your, whether it's the bin collection or the um, cycle lanes or whatever it is. Don't, don't, don't give us a kicking. Trust us to do the local issues that matter to you. But certainly, um, there is for the Prime Minister, you know, for the Prime Minister and for the government. Uh, these local elections, there is, there was always, these were always going to be a marker looking ahead through Partygate, looking ahead from the Sue Gray report. Of course, it's now been delayed, the police investigations, whether the Prime Minister was going to be fined. This was going to be the first electoral test of whether Boris Johnson still maintains his USP as being a, a Conservative leader who generally polls ahead of his own party is more popular than his own party and uh, Tory MPs have said it on the record and off the record that actually that's what they like about Boris Johnson is the fact that actually when he's been leading them he has done generally better and reached parts of the electorate that they haven't or the party brand hasn't been able to do and of course looking at the results tonight it looks like some of that at least has rubbed off. Mm. Suzanne Evans um, you haven't really got a dog in the fight in terms of <laughs> politics at the moment have you? I mean, no no politically neutral I am these days. How did you I mean you live in South West London um, obviously the Lib Liberal Democrats have done very well there I don't imagine you voted Lib Dem. Um, I didn't actually vote I'm living in Shropshire now. You can but, vote twice um, in local but, elections. <laughs> well you can but I, I don't I no longer, have, unfortunately, have a property in London anymore, so I'm, I'm out in out in uh, rural Shropshire. So we haven't got elections there at the moment. Um, I've been staying in uh, South West London the last the last week. I think this is really interesting. Um, the Wandsworth uh, issue is the big one for me. So I spent four years as a councillor in neighbouring Merton. And I'll be honest, I think most Tory councillors in Merton rather wish they were in Wandsworth, uh, not just because they lost control of the council, um, and we were, we were under no overall control at the time that I was there, but with a Labour administration. And, and it's absolutely astonishing. This is an absolute bombshell. I, I, I can't stress this enough. I mean, Wandsworth was that flagship council. If this has gone Labour, it really is 
earth shattering. Um, it's been a gradual drip drip over the years. Labour have gradually made gains. But what do you um, put that down to? I think I think I I honestly can't get my head around it. I I think Is it's it demographic change. I think it must be demographic change. Maybe it's that kind of what what they call the champagne socialist influence. Um, but council tax in Wandsworth was the lowest in the country. Uh, I think they'd compete with Westminster sometimes for that particular title. Um, but I, I remember when I was moving house within the borough when I was a councillor and going into the local estate agents and saying, look, you know, I've got to have a house in Merton, not Wandsworth, and the estate agent saying most people come to us and say the exact opposite. Most people around here want to live in Wandsworth, not Merton, because the services are better. And certainly I could see, as a councillor, looking over the border, Wandsworth was so much better run, so much more competent, and you had that low council tax. Other fees were higher. There were ways that they compensated for that. I mean, parking in Wandsworth was absolutely extortionate and still is, cost a fortune. Um, but this, for me, is, is the earth-shattering takeaway from the night. Listening to Gareth's analysis of the situation so far, uh, I must admit I'm surprised. I think otherwise it's really looking quite dull. No one party or the other has particularly made any significant gains or losses. Um, I must admit, after all the issues that we've had in, in, in national government, and let's be, let's be honest about it, right rightly or wrongly, most people vote in local elections according to national policies rather than local issues. I think that's a great shame, but that's the way it is. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about that back in May 2019 when Theresa May lost over 1,300 council seats. Um, this is nothing like that. This, mm. is, this is quite dull in comparison. So I think... Labour Hang on, we've got an hour and three quarters to go. Day. Stop <laughs> using the word dull. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to make it exciting soon, <laughs> We're going to make it Suzanne. very exciting. We, yes. we, um, so on the, on the Wandsworth point, I mean, I think you're, you're right, Suzanne, to the extent that this will be symbolically very important as mm. a win for Labour. But we've sort of touched on this earlier on in the programme. In some ways, uh, Wandsworth is a council where there are already three Labour MPs. So in terms of what it means for a future uh, general election, it's less symbolic than potentially Barnet would be, where I think we're still... Uh, but there's also, I think, the suggestion that Labour might be doing very well in Barnet. And there, there are Tory uh, MPs. Where I agree with you is... Um, sorry, Ian, that uh, this may not be as momentous a night in terms of election results as perhaps previous ones have been. Because on the one hand, uh, it doesn't feel to me as if Boris Johnson has done badly enough to be prompting lots of Conservative MPs to be spending the early hours of the morning writing their letters to the 22 committee. And nor does it feel like a real breakthrough for Keir Starmer in the sort of way that we were seeing Tony Blair do before the 1997 uh, election, for example. So um, perhaps there won't be um, enormous stories coming out of it for either of those uh, leaders tomorrow, but I don't know. Theo might uh, disagree with me. Just, I think, I think you raise a you raise an important point. This doesn't feel like going back to Blair and the, those moments. What it feels a little bit like, and and I know you can't compare local elections with national elections, but it feels a little bit like Ed Miliband 2015, mm. where Labour are making gains where they're already expected to make gains. London is a Labour city, mm -hmm. and we saw Ed Miliband. Okay, he he obviously. Labour lost in 2015 badly, but actually their vote share went up in Labour strongholds. And it feels like, OK, they've won Wandsworth, but I don't think Ed, Keir Starmer would take winning councils right across the north of England to show that he's breaking through that red, getting back that red wall, re rebuilding that red wall over winning, over winning Wandsworth, where, as you say, there are three um, Labour MPs. So it, it doesn't feel that for, for Keir Starmer to be... You know, we know the strategy that he's deploying in terms of, you know, what what he needs to do in order to win the next election. He needs to get back those seats, those key northern seats, uh, which, of course, are the foundation of Boris Johnson's 80-seat majority or 80-seat odd majority in the House of Commons. And mm. from the evidence so far, it doesn't feel like that has happened anywhere near the scale that it needs to. No, I, th I think um, I think you know Boris Johnson is fairly safe. I think on the basis of these election results, I note that John Mallinson, the Tory leader in Cumberland, has questioned his integrity and said he should go. But I think he's going to be a lone voice this morning. 
Um, now, Steve Allen fans, I uh, want to renew my apologies for appearing on the radio in his stead. Apparently, uh, one of them says, I'm a crashing bore and pompous. <laughs> Can you believe? But the, the I, I'm going to make it up to you. Because, yeah, no, about me. Um, because several of you are saying, for the full Steve Allen, can you all tell us your ideal KF, KFC order? I didn't know this was a thing on Steve Allen's show, but um, I'm a breast man myself. I'm not keen on chicken legs. I like three pieces yeah. and fries and an, an awful lot of salt. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Fear? Uh, KFC, KFC, Kentucky KFC fried, fried chicken. chicken. Nando's, yeah. isn't it? Ooh. Cheeky Nando's, Suzanne? Well, I don't eat it. I buy it for my friend Claire, who absolutely loves it. OK, right, yeah, we've, do, we've done it, the Steve Allen so experience. Sorry. It's 17 minutes past four. <laughs> this is LBC. Globe LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's 19 minutes past four on LBC and LBC News, I should say, as well. Now, Rosanna Allen Khan, who is MP for Tooting, she's at the count in Wandsworth and she says Labour have indeed gained Wandsworth. Um, as we said before, Jackie Smith, um, Sadiq Khan wouldn't have been there, have they not? Gained it. Exactly. I felt that it was going in Labour's direction at the point at which I saw on the television screen um, Sadiq Khan and uh, Rosanna um, having their photos taken and making it obvious that they were mm. uh, there. And those are the types of um, images that um, demonstrate who's feeling optimistic and positive and thinks they're on a winning streak. Well, Richard Holden, the Conservative MP for North West Durham, joins us live in the studio. Um, so far, it hasn't been a catastrophe for the Conservatives tonight, but obviously you have lost quite a lot of seats so far, uh, one or two councils. Um, what's your analysis of the night so far? I think um, you know, I think you're absolutely right, actually, and I think your analysis is pretty bang on. It's um, I think there are some predictions that the Tories losing between mid 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 uh, hundreds of seats, so five six hundred uh, mark. It doesn't look like that's going to happen tonight. Were they predictions or were they expectation management from the Conservatives? I think, in fairness, the expectation management was losing a thousand seats. So I think, <laughs> yeah, I think the um, I think the, the the more realistic predictions were in the in the mid hundreds, and it doesn't look like we're going to. Uh, see that tonight. Obviously, it's you know I don't just see us losing councillors, and I don't just see us losing councils either. Um, um, but uh, it does look it does look um, it, it doesn't look as as bad as many people have predicted. Um, Andrew Fisher joins us, former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn. Andrew, very good morning to you. Um, how do you interpret these results? Because you you were with Jeremy Corbyn on local election night in 2018, which um, that was when these seats were last fought. Um, quite a lot of gains were made then. How do you analyse the results so far? Uh, I think Labour's making some modest gains. I think, to be fair, there's still a lot to come. Uh, you know, Southampton, I think, has just declared... Uh, as a Labour game. Uh, Worthing tomorrow, I think we should be optimistic about. Um, there's obviously Wandsworth and Barnet in London, which are, are pretty much there, I think, as well, although perhaps not official yet. So there's some that are coming, um, some that are yet to declare. Um, but it's it's not it's not Labour on the path to power, put it that way. It's more a case of 
Labour is making some modest gains. The Tories are sinking a bit, um, but it seems to be the Lib Dems and the Greens that are taking more advantage at this stage, and that should worry Labour. When you won all these seats in 2018, did you think that was the beginning of the path to power? Uh, it was always going to be tough. Um, yeah, in, in 2017, at the general election, we picked up a, you know, a fair number of seats. I think we gained seats for the first time for Labour since 1997. But um, obviously Brexit then came to dominate and we're still sort of dealing with the unpacking of that. And, and the, you know, the ground has shifted a bit in terms of the demographics of the country, in terms of how it votes Conservative and, and Labour. And we're seeing that with some very strange results. Labour's doing quite badly. It lost Hull. It got some other bad results and went backwards in a few places in the northwest even. Um, so there are some odd results out there. Um, so I think that really the challenge for Labour is for Keir Starmer and, and for the sort of electoral strategists within the Labour Party now is to look at where the country is now um, and plan a route to government that sort of takes these things into account and, and focuses the party pretty relentlessly on two things. One is being organised and united, um, not sort of briefing things about who they're going to purge next, you know, just days before the local elections. And secondly, having a much clearer and sharper message uh, about the Tories' cost of living crisis, because I think that's the thing that's really going to be make or break for this Conservative government. Um, that came up on the doorstep a lot more that people are struggling um, rather than stuff around Partygate, which did come Andrew, up a little bit as well. Andrew, you obviously haven't been, it's it's Jackie, Jackie Smith, you obviously haven't been um, sent out with the sort of uh, Labour HQ line to uh, pedal this evening. Um, and uh, we've been making quite a lot about uh, the Tories and whether or not uh, Tory performance not being a bit disappointing would mean that people would in the Tory party would be putting their letters into the 1922 committee to get rid of Boris Johnson. Are you and people who are in your part of the Labour Party thinking about um, whether or not you're going to be um, making a move on um, Keir Starmer at this moment in time? Is that Are you, are you an outrider for the people who uh, never forgave uh, Starmer and the people that supported him for not supporting Jeremy enough? No, um, look, uh, Keir Starmer's the leader. He will lead Labour into the next election. There's no doubt about that, I don't think. Um, and I, I think it was silly that Lab Labour MPs or some Labour MPs, you know, decided to uh, try this coup thing against Jeremy in 2016. I, I think, you know, leave people in place unless they're doing terribly badly. Um, you know, Keir Starmer's doing OK. I just don't think he's doing good enough to win the next election at this stage. And so I think it's about trying to be more inclusive, about trying to be um, you know, more focused on taking a positive message to the country. You know, we're in an extreme combination of crises at the moment. The economy, um, the climate, um, and, and the economy is multifaceted. You know, we're talking about a recession today, the Bank of England and, you know, rocketing inflation. And that's having a huge impact on people's household incomes that's going to have multiple effects, strains on the NHS, strains on, strains on housing, you know, real risk of people being evicted uh, en masse uh, if things carry on as they are and people not being able to pay their rent or bills. So focusing on those issues and being much bolder and much more radical is important. Look, I, I don't want the party to be divided. I'm the chair of my CLP. I was out canvassing all day in Croydon, which is obviously a marginal. Um, you know, I'm trying to keep the party very united, but I want to see that replicated from the leadership. And I also want the leadership to be enthusing people and being bold. And at the moment, it's not doing that. And really, Labour relies on its activists. And there's definitely been a drop off in recent years and I think it needs to just ease off a bit and pull people together because that's how we win. I remember in 1997 that was the first election I campaigned in and there was a huge surge of membership if you remember in the run-up to 97 and a huge amount of enthusiasm to get the Tories out then. I don't feel that at the moment and I think you know if you're going to learn something from the Blair years don't learn the kind of divisive factional stuff learn the positive sort of stuff you know uh, that, that would be my message to Keir Starmer. You haven't always I mean uh, as fair I mean I agree with you Andrew although you, your behaviour hasn't always represented that have you because there's been times in the past in Croydon where you've you've been pretty critical of uh, mainstream Labour candidates uh, I think when Emily Benn stood for example you were you were pretty critical of her so uh, look, and also I, 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 Jackie just let me just stop you there I made one tweet in August 2014 way before the election 
which was critical, but it was one tweet, and I apologised for it. So let's not blow things out of proportion. We've all Um, been there, Andrew. (laughs) But of course, of course I've been critical of Labour figures at times who are in power or have got some sort of standing within the party. Quite rightly, members should hold those people to account, um, and people rightly did it to Jeremy when he made mistakes as well, or to, you know, anybody else, quite rightly. Um, But... At the end of the day, you know, I think when it comes to election time, we want to see the party united. We don't want to see the leader's office briefing about who they're going to purge what, straight after the election. What's going to happen in, in Croydon, which is a, an area, particularly with the mayor, where the Tories, I think, fancied their chances? I think it's really on a knife edge. Um, my sense today, canvassing uh, around Croydon, and I went to a few different wards, um, <coughs> is that the Labour vote's holding up. There seems to be an indication that the Tory vote isn't turning out. That might save Labour, but of course there's this new dynamic of the mayoral position, which means every vote in Croydon counts, and the turnout across the borough counts. And historically, the turnout in the south, the more Tory area, has been higher than it is in the north and the centre. Uh, which are now sort of Labour strongholds. So it, I, I'd be a fool to call it either way. I'm, I'm optimistic that Labour can both maintain a majority of councillors okay. and just about nick the mayoralty, but it's going to be very tight. Andrew, thank you. That's Andrew Fisher, former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn. And um, Richard Holden, Conservative MP. We are getting reports that the Conservatives have lost control of Westminster. Now... Westminster is a dog that hasn't really barked over the, over the course of, uh, of tonight, but Mark Wallace from Conservative Home, that's what he's saying. Um, your reaction to that? Well, um, look, looking at the last general election when I think Nicky Aitken was elected on under 40% of the vote and then the other seat in Westminster has become a safe Labour seat over time, you can see those shifts have been quite pronounced for quite a period. Similarly in Wandsworth, you know, returned three Conservative MPs at the general election in 2018. I think actually Labour may have even won the, show, won the total numbers of votes in Wandsworth, but the breakdown uh, and the ward boundaries meant that the Conservatives had held it. Um, but it's a, it would be a... You know, I don't want to see us losing any seats, uh, any councils, uh, any losses at all, but um, clearly a, a quite a... Clearly a moment. But given what's happened in Barnet, given what's happened in Wandsworth, given what may be happening in Westminster, Margaret Thatcher will be turning in her grave tonight. I think Margaret Thatcher would pursue the uh, votes of the electorate wherever they led the path to victory. And so I'd be looking at places like Oldham, where we've gained, took out the Labour, gained seats to get Labour Council leader. Bury tomorrow, I think it's going to be very interesting. Bolton, where we mo- made further gains today. Wirral, where we gained a, a seat off Labour. And, um, and, and more broadly, also, those Essex seats, which were so vital to Labour in 1997, where they're going backwards even further. Thurrock, Harlow, over in the West Midlands and Nuneaton. Well, Labour are claiming they would win Thurrock at the next general election well, I, I on think the basis very, of the results tonight. I think it would be very difficult to see how they do that, given the, given the council, uh, given they're doing worse in the council elections than they were under Jeremy Corbyn. And then uh, the MP for Thurrock was returned with a 16,000 majority last general election. Well, that is quite something to overturn, isn't it, Jackie? Uh, it's, that's very mean of you, Ian Dale. But what have I done? The, what, the 16,000 yeah. majority? Well, I think you're... Aren't, aren't you identifying the fact that my former constituency now has a 16,000... I wasn't, actually. 000? Oh, right. But, was, but, but since you, <laughs> since you, really since really you mentioned sensitive? it, I think you were, yeah. <laughs> since you weren't running, Jackie. <laughs> <Is that? laughs> I was, I, no, I wasn't running when it was a 16,000 majority, <laughs> but I did lose it. <laughs> Right, we'll come back with uh, Richard Holden, Theo Usherwood, Suzanne Evans, Gareth Knight and Jackie Smith and myself in just a moment. It's half past four on LBC and LBC News. Let's get the news headlines from Alice Bell. Labour have won Wandsworth from the Conservatives, who had held power there since 1978. Local election results are coming in. The Lib Dems have taken hold from Labour and the Green Party have so far gained seven seats. A rescue effort is underway to get more civilians out of the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol, a key target for Russia. The United Nations says a safe passage operation is in progress. And Britain could see its hottest day of the year this week. The southeast could be warmer than Mallorca today, with temperatures climbing to the mid-20s. LBC weather, rain across Northern Ireland and Scotland later this morning, but mostly warm, sunny spells for England and Wales, with highs of 21 degrees. This is LBC.
Britain's Conversation, LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. It's 4.33 on LBC. Now we have Richard Holden, Conservative MP for North West Durham, and Suzanne Evans, Director of the Public Affairs Consultancy Political Insight, former Deputy Chairman of UKIP with us. Now Jackie and I, we feel we need a little break for a little bit of recuperation, don't we? Mm. So Theo is going to interview Richard Holden. Well, they were having, we're an, interesting we're having an interesting conversation, conversation. in the break. Yeah. You, we're you going to have a dose. You, yeah. you, were saying, you were saying, Richard, about what the Tories would be hoping tomorrow, particularly in the north of England and places like the Wirral, Bury, Bolton, where you could actually see Labour councils switch to Tories, possible gains for the Conservatives. But, of course, the picture down here is very different to London. We discussed, we just had the results in, or uh, speculation now, very, very likely, I'm told, that Westminster's going to going to go from the Tories, Wandsworth, Barnet. Where is this cultural divide? Where do you think we've had so much about party gate, we've got the cost of living crisis going on, high, inflation 10% perhaps by the end of the year, according to the Bank of England. Why, why is there this difference between North and South about uh, this government and about Tories and Labour? I think... Uh you've got to look at the at the individual councils themselves. Mm. So I think some of the outer London councils, Bexley, Bromley, they definitely they look like now they're going to definitely stay Conservative. Mm. Um, Hillingdon as well. Mm. Um, but uh, I think the difference with the parts... But particularly North, North and yeah, South. But if you flip it to the inner London councils, you know, actually Labour have been doing quite well in some of these areas for quite a long time. They gained... It's the only seat that Labour gained in the last general election yeah, yeah. was actually in Wandsworth. Um, we go to the North of England, um, actually uh, some of those areas, it looks like Tories are going to make some gains. You know, Oldham, we've seen the Labour leader lose their seat. At Bolton, we saw a Tory gain. Berry, who I was campaigning there a couple of days ago, um, big differences there. Um, I think one of the things that's actually happened up there is Andy Burnham uh, looks like he's directly trying to impact cost of living by putting this new clean air zone uh, around Manchester. Now, he's stalled it after it was his big idea. Um, but obviously, whether it's deliveries coming in for shops or whether it's people uh, travelling in and out for their businesses, a major, major concern there. It looks like that he's, you know, he had a bit of a... Felt like, uh, I think... You know, described by some Labour uh, commentators as the king in the north before. I don't mm. think, uh, given the differential... But Sadiq Khan, there, Sadiq Khan has received the blame, some will say pretty unfairly, for the fact that um, the congestion charge has gone up to £15 now daily, and it's and it's at weekends as well. It's gone into the evenings, and then you've got the ULES too, and that's impacted on many uh, voters, particularly outside of London, who come into London to do their business. And he's not, we're not seeing that similar effect, or we might be seeing it in terms of the outer London boroughs where those are affected, but um, in terms of staying blue. But that donut's been there for, for years, and Boris Johnson won two mayoral victories off the back of that. Why, why do you think there is, do you think that there is just a different mentality when it comes to voting in the north of England now compared to? I, th I think I think you are seeing a, a broader a broader demographic shift, um, definitely in terms of outlook and attitude. But you could probably also see it in some of the Leave versus Remain numbers. I'm sure you'll find parts of Outer Greater Manchester which were far more Leave voting uh, than say parts. Brexit of... still playing, and that's what Professor John. Uh, well, that's, I think it's a knock on from that because I think it was a gateway for a lot of people um, to to seeing Labour in a totally different light uh, and uh, that's certainly the case in places like County Durham where I represent as well um, where, and, and I think people that the more people have seen that and the more people see also you can remember you know you've got the third Labour leader in a row who lives I know the Red Miliband represented Doncaster North but he, mm. he lives on the same road I think or just down the road from uh, Keir Starmer you know these are central London very central London but Boris, but Boris, but Boris, but Boris, is, Boris lived in Islington I mean, he he lived in Islington. He has he. There is not a northern bone in him, but it, somehow he's he's doing well up there. Whereas Keir Starmer isn't. And well, I, I, think, I, just, well, I think that's. And, I think and, I, and is it the legacy of Brexit? I mean, is it the fact that Keir Starmer campaigned for a second referendum? Is it the I, fact I, that I think, I think there's a huge amount on the fact that Keir Starmer was a in Corbyn's back to Corbyn to be leader. Um, I think there's also the the Brexit angle. He was the um, the Labour's you know Brexit guy, anti well, anti Brexit guy at the time, and I think a lot of what he's you see now is he seems to be focused on delivering, you know, a, a, a mandate and speaks to speaks to inner London in a way that Boris speaks more broadly to the country. I think if you was looking for another Labour leader at the moment, you know, you, you know, you, you, you're looking at it. How on earth is it the fact that you know Labour? 12 years into uh, either a coalition or conservative administration, you know, are, are barely making net gains on a night like this. Final question. Fantasy politics for a moment. Let's just say, 
Andrew Fisher, he, he, those around Corbyn and on the left decide that actually they want to get rid of Keir Starmer and it's not going to happen. And Andrew Fisher conceded that uh, a few moments ago. But let's just say they do get rid of Keir Starmer. Let's just say they think he's not he's not cutting through. We, 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 we want to change. Who's the one person that you would fear that would make you suddenly sit up and go, we, we've got a problem? Uh, there, I, I genuinely cannot choose somebody from the Labour front. There back. must be one. Uh, Lisa Nandy, Angela Rayner? I, uh, I think there's, I, 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 genuinely, I think actually Angela Rayner is better at the dispatch box than Keir Starmer, but um, I don't think there's any one of those who has really got all of the different facets you need to appeal as broadly as somebody like Tony Blair did in 1997 and really take that change to the country. You've got to remember there's only been one Labour leader born in the last hundred years who's actually won a general election, and that is Tony Blair. We're treating. Um, again, I don't think he quite has all of those facets lined up in the same way that Blair did. Uh, you know, maybe down the line, but who he knows? He needs a few more appearances with me and Ian on the For The Many podcast right. and in our live yes. shows. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a bit for you there, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's done it with us. That's yeah. why he's doing again, so well. Again, again. <laughs> uh, the, the question of the Tory leadership, Richard, is inevitably going to uh, be speculated on after these elections, e even if they aren't as catastrophic as maybe some people thought. Um, I mean, you, you're a staunch supporter of the Prime Minister, but um, do, do, do you think that some of your colleagues might be a little bit panicked by some of the results today, particularly in London? Uh, I don't think so with losses like this, for the, for, the, for the reasons I've outlined before, is that Wandsworth had already moved, you'd already seen that shift in 2019, um, and if you're looking at the numbers that we're looking at at the moment with Labour, you know, slightly down on Corbyn's performance in 2019, if I can see those those council numbers quite correctly from here. You know that's not going to be um, that's not going to be uh, really um, you know absolutely causing um, major concerns amongst Conservative MPs. I don't want to see us lose councillors. I don't want to see us lose councils. But given where we are in the electoral cycle, given the international pressures that are hitting us you know, from that Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has seen the oil price double, really hitting peak places like my constituency with petrol, and also, you've got to remember, a quarter of my constituents are on, on grid, so they have to get LPG uh, or, uh, or oil uh, for their central heating, which hasn't had, uh, you know, which has been rising for several months now, um, f far faster than other fuel sources. You know, with with all of that going on and the knock-on effects that's having, if, if this is if this is what Keir Starmer has to offer, um, I think um, there will be not, you know, and I'm not saying there'll be massive concern amongst Conservative backbenchers tonight. So if you look at the figures, Labour, Jackie, have lost 30 seats. I mean, that, that's, that can't be spun any other way than being a bit disastrous. Well, it's not it's not spinning. I think uh, net Labour is still up in terms of... No, the according to the season. figures that are on our television screen. Oh, right. Down three, Jackie. Um, well, they were, they were up net a little while they ago. They were up net one, um, and now they're down 33. <laughs> Which is... And there are two tests that... I mean, I'm not... As you well know, I'm not here to defend Labour, but there, it's interesting really? that... No. Okay. It's interesting that there are two tests <coughs> that the Labour representatives that we've had here this evening have set. And the evening started with um, it's about whether or not the share of the vote is increased over um, uh, over 2018 and certainly over the 2019 uh, general election. And it seems pretty likely that that will happen. And then, of course, it also became about symbolic things like... Um, uh, you know, council um, victories, which it looks in London as if they are going to be achieving. So, you know, I think if Labour politicians were being honest, they would say this is not the big breakthrough. Uh, this is not the pre-1997 sort of council election results that I can remember in the run-up to that election. Mm. Um, but nor is it a bit like for Boris Johnson, sort of... Um, uh, an absolute breaks on in terms of the progress that Keir Starmer is, has been making. Um, Gareth Knight, any, anything to report? Any interesting... I mean, we were talking about Westminster earlier on, and I, I saw you look, looking a bit sceptical about these reports that it was going from Conservative control. If there's reports from the count, then, um, you yeah, that's... Yeah, we'll we'll take that bit of gossip. I mean, certainly the results that are in so far are not, are not pointing that way. Um, but fine i mean if, if you're at the count you can actually see the the bundles of ballot papers so it will give you a better idea um it has been confirmed wandsworth has gone to labor 
Um, Barnet is... We're, we're hoping you're going to speak to Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, in just a moment. Uh, Barnet is likely to go to Labour, but the, the, the Conservatives, particularly in the Finchley third of the of the borough, are still performing very well. We talked a lot about Barnet earlier, so I won't go over it. Um, Ealing, the Conservatives, haven't been wiped out. Uh, there was a genuine worry um, that they would be wiped out there. So in that sense, it's not a total disaster for them. Um but yeah, um, overall, nationally, it's yeah, it's 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 a very mixed bag. I mean, it's 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 not great for the Conservatives in London. Um, they're not going to lose Hillingdon, by the way. That's another one that's come through. Um, but yeah, keep keep an eye on Barnet, Westminster. I'll I'll believe it when I see it with Westminster. Uh, it's very difficult to see with the results that have come in where. Labour are going to make gains there. Um, they've got big majorities in the south of Westminster. So, Suzanne Evans, you've been sitting there very patiently listening to the discussion. What, what, what do you make of Richard's argument there? Well, I think um, I think he's, he's 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 right. I think there is a difference between London and the rest of the country. I think he's absolutely right about the Brexit issues still being front and centre, actually, in this. Um, but there's a big elephant in the room here, isn't there? Looking at turnout. Uh, it's around about 25% across the board. That's pretty devastating uh, commentary, I think, on the state of politics today. If you've only got one in four people who are willing to turn out to vote, I think no wonder we're getting this mixed picture. Certainly just just my own experiences, if, if I was going to vote, I wouldn't be quite sure who to vote for, to be honest. I, I haven't voted in this election, but I would be struggling. Um, friends of mine come, came, came home and said they, they'd sport their ballot paper. I think there is a massive disillusionment with politics. I'm not saying there isn't always some disillusionment with politics. There is. But I think now more than ever it's being felt. But I think all the political parties need to sit down and ask themselves a hard question tonight. Why are only one in four people actually bothered mm. to be engaged? And, and Gareth, do we get to know how many sport ballot papers there are at each count? Yeah, and not least because a lot of the returning officers have actually just taken photos of the declaration sheet that they showed to all the candidates that actually lists it. So some um, sad geek like you is, is going to, <laughs> at, yep. at some point, calculate all the sport ballot papers from these elections and compare them to 2018. I think that might be quite an interesting result. Mm. Uh, it may be a very interesting result. I think that's something that I will definitely do over the weekend rather than right now. Um, but generally speaking, you do tend to get um, you know, a fair number of spoiled ballot papers, not as many as you might think. Um, and all the spoiled mm. ballot papers do get looked at by the agents of all political parties as well. So if you do write or draw something on your ballot paper... Yeah. Um, and we know what, one of the most popular things is to draw on ballot papers, oh, in on. my experience. Yeah. Part of a male body... I did I've seen on a, a ballot paper a I, few I, times. I did once hear, uh, um, a, I, I think it was fairly tongue-in-cheek, but one of the uh, local candidates at the count try and make out that the particular part of that anatomy was actually a vote because well, it was by a particular party. Be, because the, the yeah. condition is, isn't it? And I know, I know exactly what you mean, Suzanne. <laughs> the condition is that the mark needs to show an obvious intent to support a particular candidate. Well, frankly, you know, if you put a willy opposite <laughs> a Labour candidate's name, then that strikes me that that's a Labour vote. No, because you're calling him a complete dick. It doesn't... <laughs> no, you might, be, you might be saying something complimentary about their anatomy, mightn't you? It's 4.46. <laughs> LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Millions went to the polls across the United Kingdom to cast their votes in the local election. With the Prime Minister plagued by negative headlines, did it turn out to be a piece of cake for Boris Johnson? I've received a fixed penalty notice from the Metropolitan Police relating to an event. I once again offer a full apology. And has Beergate meant it all went flat for Sir Keir Starmer's chances? We were in the office, we were working, we stopped to have something to eat. There was no party. There was no breach of the rules. Join me, Nick Ferrari, for a specially extended local election special from 6am as all the results and your reactions come in. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
ABC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Text 84850. It's 4.48 on LBC. Theo Usherwood, our political editor, is with us, along with Richard Holden, Conservative MP for North West Durham, and Suzanne Evans, Director of the Public Affairs Consultancy Political Insight. Now, we are hoping to speak to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, in the next few minutes. So let's have a little chat about Sadiq Khan. And what, I mean, obviously, he's been at Wandsworth tonight because he calculated that uh, Labour was going to win it correctly, as it turns out. He will be cock a hoop that they've uh, won Wandsworth, they're going to win Barnet, and they possibly, I mean, Westminster, I'm not, not sure they're going to win Westminster, but it could go to no overall control. I'm by, by any stretch of the imagination, that will really give him a fillip for another mayoral run in 2024. Or will it? Or, of course, as we've seen with previous mayors of London, sometimes when they've done that job, they decide they fancy going back into Parliament again and having if, a if shot. If the ball becomes free from the scrum. The, the well, problem... The problem with that is that he needs to bank on Keir Starmer being Prime Minister. He's done the Shadow Cabinet. He doesn't want to... He's even been in, he's been in the government. He's been a front bencher. He hasn't been, on the, obviously, in the Cabinet itself. But he, what's the point in going back to be a, another a Shadow Minister again? And when you speak to people well, around... You might want to be leader. You get, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Keir, leader of the party. Well, if Keir yes, Starmer loses yes, the next absolutely. election... I mean, Richard, I, how would you feel about Sadiq Khan being leader of the Labour Party? Okay. The Conservative? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hold uh, North West Durham with an increased majority who always leads the Labour Party and will make gains across the North as well. And, who, and in London, whether it's Sadiq or Keir. Who would you fear more as leader of the Labour Party, Sadiq Khan or Andy Burnham? Uh, I certainly fear uh, either of them more than I'd fear Keir Starmer. I think Richard doesn't want to nail, nail his colours to the mask. Well, he just one. did. Encourage one of them to go forward. <laughs> he might, go back, he might <laughs> go back in to be Chancellor. No, but the point is, well, you're assuming that Labour wins the next election. If they don't, I mean, do, do you think they're going to give Keir Starmer a second chance? No. I doubt it. I, but much. I think the party, will tack, the party will tack back to the left. It may not tack back to the left as in tacking back to the Diane Abbott's, Jeremy Corbyn's, John McDonald's of this world, but they, I think the Labour Party, whoever goes for that leadership after Keir Starmer, is going to need that caucus, and they will be much more, they'll be having felt betrayed by Keir Starmer and the fact that they don't think he's stuck to his ten promises, they are going to be a much more powerful group this time around in choosing the next Labour leader if, Keir Star if the Keir Starmer project fails. So whoever goes for that election is going to have to find a way of bringing and, and be successful in that Labour leadership election is going to have to find a way of bringing them o on board and they are going to be a much more Keir Starmer has done a huge amount when, when it's come to anti-Semitism, radical support to try and keep that grouping within the Labour Party out of the way and but down do you and think, out. I don't do you think, think Sadiq Khan will, will run for a third term as Mayor of London? No I don't. Well what's he going to do then? I think I know what he might do. I think, he, I think he's going to do a David well, Miliband. I think he's going to go. Oh, really? I, think he, I think that's what I think he's going to do. Yeah, I think he's going to go and get a. I think he's going to go and get a big job abroad. But that's just a prediction, what, from based on conversations with those around him. That's interesting. I mean, I that, think he's going. Yeah, that's what I. That's. I, I think if he doesn't go for a third term, I think he's going to. Yeah, go but if you were going to go for a big job abroad, would big you job be, abroad or a big in working in a you know you know a major university abroad or something like something like that. Would you be in at the ones with count this evening, having your photo taken and essentially? I mean, I know he's actually his. But, but that's if the project fails. Single. That's if the project fails. I mean, he's working towards. I think the two do work together. I think he's working towards a Labour victory. He's a close to Keir Starmer. He wants Keir Starmer to be prime minister. Mm -hmm. If Keir Starmer is prime minister, I think he will. The, the timings possibly work, or they'll be very close. But he'll give up the Labour mayoralty, and he'll go into he'll go into a very senior position within his cabinet, um, and quite rightly so, given that he's the most powerful. But, the, but they'll let's both be in May 2024, won't they? Let's come back to not the. I, I disagree with you, Theo, and not only because this is what I hope will happen. I disagree with you about your view of what would happen if Keir Starmer lost the next general election. I mean, I think. It's an enormously difficult task, and let's assume that he did lose it. We had this discussion earlier on with Siobhan McDonough, and we couldn't quite tempt her into saying whether or not she thought Keir Starmer was um, uh, Tony Blair or Neil Kinnock. You know, quite rightly, she said, well, he's Keir Starmer. But there is an argument, isn't there, that what Keir Starmer is doing in terms of what he's already done, in terms of making the party more electable again, mm -hmm clearing out the things Which that happened done. during yeah, the Corbyn absolutely. years absolutely. is actually the paving of the way to an improved performance in uh, 2024. If not a victory, then certainly, you know, a strong uh, 
direction, which would argue to the rest of the Labour Party that the idea that you go back to a sort of, um, even towards a Corbynite left would be a, a very bad idea. And what's more, there wouldn't be the but, 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 he, but, he, but he, he needs he needs either to win or he needs to he needs to be able to at least get into a position where he's prime minister, even if it's of a, of a, a, a rainbow coalition with the Liberal Democrats, or the SNP, or, or whatever. And if he doesn't do if he doesn't do that at the very least, and he doesn't become uh, prime minister, then he will inevitably, I think we would agree, he would have to go as Labour leader. He couldn't remain in uh, opposition for another four or five years. Um, uh, that, that might be right, but I think the Labour Party's learnt the lesson of what happens when you go back to where we were But, but their argument would be, their argument would be you can't have continuity. I'm, I'm playing double, I, mm. I, I, I take your point, but there, the argument is you can't have continuity care. And, and that you would have, and I'm not, I'm not saying that they would that sort of that grouping of uh, on the left i don't think that will happen i don't think they will go for um uh, somebody within that caucus whether it's um uh, zara sultana or john mcdonald or whatever i just it's not going to happen what i do think it will happen is that whoever is to be successful in that election and this is what keir starmer remember did successfully yeah. when he became labor leader is that they are going to be a much tougher they're going to be much harder in making sure that whoever is Labour leader brings them in. And as Andrew Fisher was saying, is in quote unquote inclusive in bringing that group into the party. And that comes, as you know, Jackie, at a huge price. That is that is a very, very risky strategy and didn't work out well when Corbyn was leader. But Let's finish the hour on something completely different. Charlie in Slough says, good morning, Ian. Can I ask the panel what their thoughts are on adding an abstain box on ballot papers, i.e. none of the above, I suppose? It's something I've wanted to see for a long time. It would be, it would, it, it would it doesn't, he's missed out a word here and I don't know what it is. It would, it would remove, remove the need, the need to, spoil to spoil a ballot and will encourage more people to vote, I think. Suzanne, what do you think? think none of the above. I think it's a great idea. Absolutely great idea. The question, of course, is if none of the above wins the election, what happens then? Do we have to hold it again? You have to hold Do it again with different candidates, candidates, I suppose, don't you? Um, I, I think, would, yeah, excellent idea. Go for it. Richard? I think it's slightly farcical. Uh, I think we had uh, reopened nominations for students' unions, and that's where they belong. I think people are making a positive choice, and if they really want to spoil our ballot paper, they can do. But I think uh, I think what we should be doing is trying to encourage as many people uh, to vote as possible, and that make, means actually having to make a decision, because politics is about having to make a decision uh, about who you think is best. It is a decision, Richard. Saying none of the above, I don't approve of any of the above, no, it's, it's no, a decision. It's, it's actually, and it it's might a encourage people to vote. It's, it's a cop-out. It's a cop-out, because you're not actually making a positive decision for somebody um, I think we, we exist in a system where you, you've got to make a decision one way or, or the other um, saying none of the above is uh, you know what, what's what's the logical consequence of that uh, I think you know people should uh, make make a, make a decision N nobody n no party's perfect but you've got plenty of choices and if you don't like the options on there stand yourself <laughs> I think we were discussing it earlier on the suggestion w when you know all of us I think who've knocked on doors have been confronted by people who've said um, no I, I'm not voting you're all the same or I can't be bothered to vote and people had various different ways that they um, responded to it and I always used to say to people well the thing is somebody is going to get elected yeah. the only thing you can be sure of is that you won't have had a say in who it is that's going to do it but to return to where we are before I don't think you, you don't want to none of the above box because that will prevent people from drawing willies on ballot paper <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh, well, Suzanne's point, point, the, fun the willies could get elected couldn't they if there were enough of them well sometimes well, they do Jackie indeed they argue Quite a few of them, yeah. <laughs> OK, Dickie Holden. Um, <laughs> right, a um, couple of texts and tweets Every here. Every Prime Minister needs a word. Exactly. <laughs> uh, this is not a criticism whatsoever, but why are you on overnight on LBC when most of the results won't be in until you are in your bed tomorrow? A pointless shift. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. We've been on air for seven hours. <laughs> and you, uh, It's some random Twitter person. Mm. Um, 
Well, of course you have to be on. I mean, I think about a third of the results have been announced so far. I must admit, I thought it would be rather more than that by the time we get to five o'clock. You Can't wonder why it does take so long. They really have they got really slower do. and slower. Um, and uh, Desiree says, I'm a staunch Labour Party member and voter. However, I'm quite happy for the Lib Dems and Greens to pinch the Blues bricks from their walls. I'm quite happy for us to coalesce with other parties. Well, we might talk a little bit about that in a moment as well. Well, uh, we've got one minute to go before the news at five. Um, quick question, very short answers. Uh, will Boris Johnson face a leadership challenge after these elections? Suzanne Evans? No. Gareth Knight? No. Theo Usherwood? No. Jackie Smith? No. Richard Holden? No, but Kirsty Simon might. Oh. <laughs> really? You don't really believe that? Uh, no, do you? no, genuinely. Uh, with, with, uh, the fact is that back in 2018, um, Corbyn made. Corbyn made over 80 gains and four years before that Miliband made over 300. If Labour don't dramatic, if the things are dramatically changed from the numbers we're seeing tonight and it looks like Labour are level pegging from where they were in 2018 on these council results, I think they, I think he genuinely could. We are going to say goodbye to Richard Holden and Suzanne Evans. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on our show. Um, in a moment, we're going to be speaking to Jonathan Reynolds, Shadow Business Secretary, Labour MP for Slowly Bridge and Hyde, Albie Amancona, co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism for Equality, and Adrian Ramsey, co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. And Jackie Smith will have a go at him as well about NATO policy, <laughs> I imagine, because if, <laughs> if she doesn't, I certainly will. Yeah. And we'll be speaking to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's five o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player, and play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at five o'clock, Labour's celebrating a big win in London in the local election results. They've taken Wandsworth from the Conservatives after 44 years in a major blow to Boris Johnson. London Mayor Sadiq Khan explains what he thinks are the main reasons for this result. We were hearing about the cost of living crisis. We were hearing about concerns that uh, residents had about the cuts from the government. And also, to be frank, Boris Johnson was coming up uh, and it worked in our interest. Labour has also won the brand new Unitary Authority of Cumberland. Tory leader of Carlisle City Council, John Mallinson, thinks Boris Johnson needs to shoulder some of the blame. I think he should consider his position now. I'm, I fully expect that there will be more letters to the chairman of the uh, 22 committee. But Conservative MP for Peterborough, Paul Bristow, has defended Mr Johnson. Boris Johnson is the biggest electoral asset that this party has had, or the Conservative Party have had, in a generation. Uh, he's the only Prime Minister to deliver a substantial majority since the majorities of Margaret Thatcher. I know he had a majority in 2015, but it was only a small one. So Boris Johnson is a proven electoral asset. He's never lost an election. Counting will start later for the rest of England's councils and those in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We might not find out the final picture until Saturday afternoon, though. In Ukraine, another effort is underway to evacuate civilians from the port city of Mariupol, which is close to being captured by Russian forces. The United Nations says it won't go into detail to avoid undermining the operation. Hundreds of people are still trapped out of steelworks where Ukrainian soldiers are resisting. Oxford University has an announced a fully funded scholarship scheme for Ukrainian refugees. It will begin in the next academic year and will support highly qualified graduates from Ukraine whose lives have been disrupted by the ongoing conflicts. More than half of people who still use cash say it helps them keep track of their spending. The consumer group which asked 4,000 people about their use of money. In the city, the FTSE 100 will reopen at 75.03 after closing up 10 points yesterday. The pound buys $1.23 and 1 euro 17. LBC weather, rain across Northern Ireland and Scotland this morning. Mostly warm, sunny spells for England and Wales with highs of 21 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Alice Bell. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. 
Three minutes past five on LBC and LBC News. Seven hours to go, done, one hour to go. Jackie Smith and I with you until six, and then Nick Ferrari takes over. Uh, Mike on Twitter says, well done on your mammoth overnight broadcast. I've been listening throughout the night. By far the most informative programme on the election results. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we're going to get some more information and entertainment from Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. He joins us live uh, on the phone. Hello, Sadiq. Ian, I'm happy to do both entertainment and information. I'm in Wandsworth, <laughs> and I'm cock well, a I, hoop. Uh, Jackie I will imagine... know this. I was, I was eight years old the last time this council was uh, Labour. I'm now, uh, you know, a man with grey hair. And for the first time in 44 years, I can report to you and Jackie, uh, Wandsworth Council, Labour gain. And Barnet Council, I think, is going to be a Labour gain as well. And there are rumours that Westminster Council, it might not be a Labour gain, but the Conservatives certainly look as if they might be losing it. Could you have imagined this at the beginning of the evening? Uh, yes and no. Let me see what, what, why, why I say that, Ian. I mean, I, I, I've been working with the local activists in both Barnet and Westminster, and the majorities the Conservatives have in those wards are, are huge. In Barnet, uh, which is different to Westminster, uh, with, with the explanation for our, our progress, four years ago we had huge problems with the local community, uh, understandably, been very angry at us because of their view that we were anti-Semitic. Uh, Keir has taken some really strong action in relation to rooting out uh, anti-Semitism for our party and families are coming back to Labour. And we've also been making really good up on the doorstep in Barnet uh, as well. The local residents are unhappy with the Conservative Council there. I I'm not willing to call it yet, but, you know, I was out this morning and it was really positive on the doorstep in Barnet and uh, watched that space. Westminster is different. Uh, Karen Buck does a brilliant job there. And by the way, Barnet, you know, Ian, has three... Tory MPs uh, with small majorities, so it matters in relation to next general election. Uh, Westminster is different. We've got Karen Buck, who's loved. Uh, she used to be a marginal seat. She was elected at the same time as Jackie. Works her, worked her socks off. Is loved by the community. Um, and what you've got there is the local Labour team led by Adam within council wards that was unrealistic, if I'm honest with you. And, uh, you know, if I was speaking to you at 7 a.m. this morning, I'd have bitten your hand off on some of the seats who may be winning Westminster. I think that the, the, the mountain to win the council is just probably too far uh, in Westminster. But we're making really good progress. Why does that matter? Because it's not just share of the vote, but there are seats in Westminster we'd want to win in addition to Karen's if we're going to have Keir Starmer in 10 Downing Street. Sadiq, um, I did note that crack about how Karen's done really well and I'm no longer in Parliament. So, um... I wasn't meant that way, Jack. <laughs> Um, so, so let me so let me ask you this, uh, Sadiq Khan. Um, Labour's done slightly less well outside uh, London uh, in terms of the gains that it's made. It's done uh, clearly really well inside London. So, who's responsible for that? Is that your leadership, your Labour leadership in London, or is that Keir Starmer's? Oh, listen, no, we've got to give credit to our leader. Uh, and what Keir's done in relation to a combination of things, anti-Semitism, but also making us a credible opposition is really important. I and mean, the great thing about London is. Uh, it's in the humility. We can point to Labour councils uh, that are run really well. We're, we're on the side of local residents. You have the, the City Hall uh, Mayor, of course. And here in Wandsworth, uh, Ian knows very well, as I'm sure you do, three cracking Labour MPs. You know, Fleur and Putney was what the, our only game in 2019. Marshall and Batsy was then or in Tootin. So we can point to Labour champions doing a good job, as indeed in Westminster with uh, Karen. And so there's, there's, in my view, four big factors, Jackie, and I've been knocking doors, you know, every day for the last few weeks. The cost of living crisis is biting into Tory voters as well as people who voted over in the past with Dems and Greens. Uh, the public do feel the cuts have been made by the government and Tory councils. Boris Johnson is a vote winner for us. Genuinely, I'm not just saying this to stir. He's a vote winner for us. And both he cares a positive for us. I mean, honestly, uh, he, he's a positive in ways uh, previously it is in the recent past haven't. I've got to be frank about that. Sadiq, thank you very much for joining us. That's Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. He's been at the count in Wandsworth, naturally cock hoop given the result there for the Labour Party. Um, well, let me introduce our new panel to you. We have Jonathan Reynolds, uh, Shadow Business Secretary, Labour MP for Staley Bridge and Hyde, uh, Alby Amancona, co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism for Equality, and Adrian Ramsey, co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. Welcome to all three of you. Um, 
Johnny, let's start with, with you. Um, you've been touring the radio and TV studios. Um, we're, we're sort of tail end Charlie, I think, aren't we? But also, have you saved the best till last? I, I, I've yes. been looking forward to this. I think you're all looking marvellous for the stint you've done. I said, give my congratulations to the makeup team here at the studio. I think they've, uh, they've kept <laughs> what you makeup going. Team? Oh, exactly. So, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm finding a way to say it's your natural beauty shining through after several hours. But um, yeah, look, I mean, I don't know if you remember it. Remember you were having a conversation after the, the morning after the 2019. Uh, general election, I came on your show and the 2019 general election, I mean, a terrible result for Labour. There was just no other way to spin it. You had to hold your hands up and say, you know, I look tonight, of course it's not the full picture for where we want to be, but the level of progress since 2019. I mean, look, people said, is Labour going to win the key bellwether councils like Southampton? Well, the answer to that tonight is yes. Is it going to win, you know, what, I don't like the phrase red wall, but we know what those areas mean. I mean, the Cumberland result, I was in Carlisle yesterday, the Cumberland result is sensational. Genuinely sensational, probably the most significant of the night. And then you look at... Is it? Why? Well, because so it's a new council. That's an area that includes um, Conservative-held seats like Copeland and, and Workington. Labour has... But they always used to be Labour seats, didn't well, they? Why, look, should you be, why should this be such a momentous council to win? Well, I just, in my view, given expectations and how tight people thought it would be, a three-way race for a new, uh, a new council, a new unitary authority being created, I think Labour coming out with 30 seats there is amazing. And then you have these iconic Conservative strongholds like ones with, you know, and add to that, I think, a very significant results coming in Barnet for the, the problems we've had to address in the Labour Party around anti-Semitism, that would be incredibly significant. So, you know, having been on election night when things haven't been so well for Labour, uh, there's enough here to be positive about. Because you do look quite perky, I have to say. Well, <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I thought I would struggle to, uh, you know, even get through <laughs> until six o'clock because I've been in my own constituency in every ward and then come down to do this media. But look, yeah, it's not, you know, no one is saying it's job done from the Labour Party, but there's some really encouraging signs here and it is down to Keir Starmer and the leadership he has shown. Abhi um, Amankona, you, you are what I would describe as a, a moderate Conservative. I mean, when you look at the state of the, the modern Conservative Party, um, d what were you hoping from these elections? Because there, there were people on, shall we say, on the left of the Conservative Party who might have hoped for actually rather bad results so they could get rid of the Prime Minister. Were you one of them? Well, I certainly wasn't hoping for bad results for the Conservative Party. I'm a Conservative member, activist, and I'm loyal to the party. I'd never want a bad result for the party. And this isn't a bad result for the party, Ian. A couple of weeks ago, some people were predicting losses of 800 seats. That's not going to happen. And I think as well, you would have expected with all the stuff going on with Partygate and all of the scandals since last November, since the Patterson scandal, which I've spoken about a lot, you'd be expecting Labour to be doing a lot better. And this is not looking like Labour winning councils like they were in the 90s before Blair was elected. Albie, it was, it was Tory spinners that were prophesying 800 uh, losses, wasn't it, as a sort of bit of expectation management. Now, you Johnny have to raise every other political party yeah. to which we need to lose 800. I mean, we already hauled off the seats. Johnny mentioned tonight. Carlisle, and the leader, the Tory leader of Carlisle Council, has been super critical of Boris Johnson this evening, as have some other losing Tories around the country. Is he going to face a challenge from his own MPs for not having done as well as perhaps, uh, you know, he should have done given uh, his, you know, the, the approach of the, the view of the Tories that he's their sort of winning thing when it comes to the North and the Red Wall seats in particular? Well, Jackie, I think we're going to have to wait until we get the full picture before I can comment on anything like that. But the way that things are looking at the moment... It's not looking to me like the landslide loss for the Conservatives that would usher more MPs to put letters into the 1922 committee. I mean, you must agree with that, surely. Well, you, you, made us, you made us answer earlier on whether or not we thought uh, Boris Johnson was still going to be the leader of the Tory party. I think he is. So, But I do think it's uh, significant when you have um, Tory local government leaders who are clearly thinking that uh, his leadership is no longer the advantage that they thought it was before and are willing to publicly criticise him. Of course, there's always a bit of, you know, people are feeling emotional if they've lost their council seats or if they've lost their council but usually they're disciplined enough not to criticise the Prime Minister and that would never have happened previously. The guilt has clearly gone off him and people are believing... The having guilt is, oh, G-I-L-T, G -I -L -T. as opposed to G-U-I-L-T. Exactly, the guilt, the G-U-I-L-T is on him and the so G-I-L-T is off, off him. him. Yeah. I'm glad we got that sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say one thing about this comparison to the 90s? Because I think, you know, if I talk to you, colleagues who are in the Cabinet, 
or shadow cabinet pre-97, one thing they will always say, I think they're right on this, is, you know, this country effectively still had two-party politics leading into 97, including in Scotland. So effectively, if one party went down, the other one kind of went up automatically. Now, that isn't the case, and we know it hasn't been the case. You know, no one doubts the SNP are significant players in Scotland. The Green Party, the Liberal Democrats, independence and local government. I think we've seen more of that in the last few years because you've seen such a squeeze on council budgets, no matter who runs them. There's actually been far less money to spend on the on the things councillors have discretion over, parks and bins and, and you know, cleaning the streets because obviously the, the burden which is social care which local government pays has become a much bigger part of it. I think that's opened up you know, a lot of resentment towards incumbent councils and more people have come into it but I think to try and compare you know, British politics in the late 90s to now would be to miss out some very significant things that have happened in the interim. Um, Adrian Ramsey, co-leader of the Green Party, um, what, how has it been for you tonight? We had your colleague Carla on earlier mm. and she was reeling off quite a few gains and we've reported on quite a few green gains mm. but not, not really a major breakthrough for the Greens, is it? Uh, well, there have been even more gains since uh, Carla on, uh, us. earlier on. Um, well, um, I think the um, in, in the last couple of hours we've seen Worcester go into no overall control, and um, so further gains from the Greens there, and that's one of a number of councils where and some Labour gains, yes, and sure, yeah, sh and, sh and so it's no overall control. So, it, but it, it puts all the parties, including the Greens, in a better position of influence, doesn't it, when councils are in no overall control, and we've seen Greens make breakthroughs onto new councils from. Coventry and, and um, Plymouth, for example, one big majority against Labour, one big majority against the Conservatives. So we, we are seeing a nationwide trend of, of Greens winning more seats in record numbers from Labour and from the Conservatives. Uh, and, you know, there's nowhere that the Greens can't win now. We're, we're really pleased with the progress we're making and people looking for a positive alternative. Well, I think that's an interesting point because... Up until comparatively recently, green gains tended to be concentrated in three or four areas where you look at the, the gains that they've been today and they are literally all over the country. Yes, absolutely they are. And that includes um, some uh, some big cities that we've had councillors in for some time that you were perhaps referring to, Ian, like um, Sheffield, where we've made a, a, a further gain tonight, uh, and also... Um, Brighton, Bristol, Norwich, where we've had seats for some time, Oxford, we've made further gains. But also we've been seeing uh, Greens making breakthroughs in, in some traditional um, industrial towns and, and, and areas like South Tyneside, where we've doubled our number of seats. And importantly, we're seeing lots of green gains from the Conservatives as well. I've already mentioned uh, Worcester and Plymouth. And there's many rural areas of the country where Greens are making substantial gains from the Conservatives and rural counties like Herefordshire and Suffolk, where in large parts of the county we're the main challenger to the Conservatives. So it does, it does really bode well for the range of areas where people are electing Greens. Um, we'll come on to uh, your policy on NATO in a moment because Jackie eviscerated Carla on that, I'm afraid, and we're going to see if she can repeat the feat with you. <laughs> That's what happens at 5.15, isn't it? In the, <laughs> just gratuitous, really, isn't it? I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was raising an interesting point of international comparison mm -hmm. as to why, uh, in Germany, the Greens are influential, are part of the government, are taking, in my view, the right approach to what's happening in Ukraine. Mm. Well, and we will come on to that in a second, because I do have to go to a break, because it's 16 minutes past five. This is LBC. I'm...
LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Text 84850. It's 18 minutes past five. We have with us in the studio Jonathan Reynolds, Abby Amancona and Adrian Ramsey. Um, but first, let's uh, talk about this referendum in Bristol. We talked about it a couple of hours ago. And uh, voters in Bristol have chosen to scrap their directly elected mayor and instead put committee of lo committees of local councillors in charge of decision-making, which is effectively what the, most of the country uh, does. Well, Tom Seymour is LBC's reporter in Bristol. Tom, very good evening. What, was it a big margin? It was a... Good, uh, good morning, sorry. Morning, in yeah, I know we're all a bit confused with the election night, aren't we? Um, yeah, it was a 59% uh, voted in favour of scrapping the mayor and, and switching to the committee system, but there was only a 29% turnout overall, which was actually up from uh, 10 years ago when Bristol voted to bring in a mayor in a referendum. Um, that was around 24%, but it's certainly an historic night for politics here in Bristol and how the city will be run in the future. And the, uh, the directly elected mayor will be scrapped from 2024 onwards. And as you say, instead of having the mayor having the ultimate say on the big decisions affecting the city there'll be a committee system instead groups of councillors sitting on committees in key areas like education transport uh, social care that that kind of thing um two people have held the the role of the mayor since it came in 10 years ago um one of them was george ferguson he was the first he was an independent and then labor's marvin reese has been in power for the last two terms i spoke to him afterwards and he said he was disappointed but not surprised with the result um he was going to step down in 20 24 in any case um, he's already said he wasn't going to run for a third time and he will remain in power until 2024 but of course from then onwards we'll switch to this committee system and it'll be a, a big change for how political leadership in Bristol continues. Uh, and was this really a referendum on him or the system? Well, he says it wasn't, but he also mentioned that it was a personal reflection. Perhaps there were some councillors who uh, who weren't happy with him and weren't happy with the result last year, because it was only in 2021, it was only 12 months ago, that he won that second term um, and will be in power in, until 2024. And, and as he pointed out, more people turned out in the, the mayoral election and, and he won that. And, you know, he said there's maybe a little bit, or he implied that there's maybe a little bit of a, a bitterness from, from those that didn't win in, in that election. Election, but I think it is fair to say that there is a it's going to have some personal reflection on him regardless of the fact that he'd already said he was going to step down in, in 2024 um, but but yeah the the line is that it, it's not a it's not a reflection on him but I, I don't know I think the people in Bristol will probably uh, were probably looking at that or maybe thinking about that when they put their cross in the box they did. Tom, thank you. That's Tom Seymour in Bristol. Let's cross to Charlotte Lynch, who's LBC's reporter at the Count in Barnet. Um, Charlotte, uh, give us the latest. It seems a very bad night for the Conservatives. Well, on the ground here, the Conservative Party uh, leader, the council leader, uh, Daniel Thomas, has just accepted defeat. There was a huge cheer uh, from Labour here, as Daniel Thomas confirmed here on the ground. The Conservatives have lost control of Barnet Council. It will, it looks like, go to Labour. They have taken the key seats uh, of West Hendon, uh, Whetstone, the key wards, also the ward uh, of Childs Hill. And we are hearing murmuring that Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, will be making his way up the Northern Line later today. It's reported that he could be here to celebrate this victory. And this is where he had focused his party's efforts. Of course, the Labour Party had a lot to do here to rebuild their relationship with the Jewish community. Barnet has one of the UK's largest Jewish populations. And Labour was, of course, dogged by allegations of anti-Semitism under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. That saw Conservatives make gains here in 2018. So this is a huge victory, not just for Labour, but also for, as I say, that relationship with the Jewish community, fighting those allegations of anti-Semitism. And it's expected that that is why Sir Keir Starmer will come here to celebrate that victory. This is where he launched Labour's nationwide local election campaign uh, back in April, sending that clear signal uh, about how seriously the party are taking uh, that relationship and it appears that it has paid off here in Barnet. The uh, Conservative Council leader Daniel Thomas uh, just now accepting defeat. Charlotte, thank you. Um, Jackie, the day after local elections, the, the, if a party leader or if a party has done particularly well, the party leader always goes to the, 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 the totemic mm. seat. Now, what 
would, would you go to West, would you go to Wandsworth or would you go to Barnet or would you pick if there's a council in the red wall that Labour have picked up which I don't think there is at the moment but there may well be by the, the time the votes are all counted or would you go there just to be, just to symbolize that that's where Labour win, can win seats back well I mean let's let's be fair uh, Labour already had more than half the seats that are being contested this evening. So there was not going to necessarily be a big breakthrough in some of those other councils. And it doesn't look as if there's going to be a red wall council that Keir Starmer could go to. And if there was, I agree with you, that's where he would Wouldn't go. Cumberland, but I think... Cumberland? But I Cumberland think, red wall? Well, red wall is used to almost mean any area the Labour Party has held. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it's quite... A, People, it's a shorthand that, that really describes seats that Conservatives It's an awfully first. long journey to get there, wasn't well, that, it? And there are logistics. Some of us made the journey in the campaign, that's all I'll say. <laughs> that, you know. Johnny made the important point earlier on, which is um, Keir Starmer has a strategy for getting back into government following the appalling losses that Labour made in 2019 under Jeremy Corbyn. And it started with detox of cleaning out the party and detoxifying the brand and in particular addressing anti-semitism and it is symbolic of him having reached that point that barnet is now returning to labor control mm. and it might be to represent that that he would travel to barnet it's part of what has been a very successful night in london it's part of this journey that he's on i think you know johnny rightly earlier described it as that it's not the whole way to getting Labour back into government, but it's an important part of Keir Starmer's strategy that it would be manifest by that. Um, have you got a trip planned tomorrow, Adrian? Uh, well, there's a number of places we could potentially go to. As Jackie says, leaders will go to places where parties have made big gains. So we're confident that may well be the case in Reading, for example. Uh, we've already seen significant gains in South Tyneside. Uh, we think that could well also happen in Burnley and in Hastings. So we may have a few to choose from um, to be decided. Well, I, I wait to look look on your website and see where you, you ended up going. Um, Albie, would you give any advice to Keir Starmer on where he ought to go? Um, I think my, my <laughs> question would be... Sounded, it was He's very... Sensitive. He's very good at giving advice. Albie is very, <laughs> Albie is very polite, but when you set him up with, yeah. would you give any advice on where, on telling Keir Starmer where he should go? Had Albie not been so polite, he might. Do you want to do this next year or not? <laughs> to be honest My with advice? you, to be honest with you, it's up as five in the morning. I'm not sure I do. No. <laughs> anyway, Albie. My advice to Keir Starmer would be: you need to do better in the red wall because ultimately the question is. Does Labour need to do well in London? We already know that Labour does well in London, so Labour doing even better in London, I don't really think pushes the needle with the Labour Party winning the next general election in any meaningful direction. And I think the fact that the Tories have done quite well in, in parts of the country quite near to where Jonathan is from or where my family are from, Bury, Oldham, Bolton, actually should concern the Labour Party more and give the Conservative Party well, more reason to be pleased about the results or not as disappointed with the results tonight as they could have been. I mean, many of us were thinking we'd do a lot worse than we have done tonight. And I think the fact that Labour has not made any breakthroughs in the red wall should be a concern to Keir Starmer's Labour Party. Just, just directly on that point, I mean, obviously we, we haven't got the full picture yet mm. and it's not the full country voting, but we would know that, for instance, Labour would win Thurrock, Lee, Copeland, Workington, Hartlepool. That's not... I, I would love to know that. how they calculate that they would win Thurrock. Because it's got a 16,000 majority. The, the Conservatives held the council there. How, do, how on earth do they it, it, it will be based on aggregate vote share. But I'm just, I'm just, on what we know, I'm giving you examples where I think that's significant. I mean, I'll tell you where I'll be going tomorrow, which is to Sunderland, and I'm going to confess that it is to attend the uh, playoff you lost semi -final. A few, You lost a few seats in Sunderland, Well, you? but what is significant about Sunderland is that on the pattern of the last few years, we would have lost control. The Prime Minister visited it, the Chancellor visited mm. it. Let's be honest, they wouldn't have gone unless they thought they were going um, to win. <clears throat> and actually, Sunderland is a very significant result tonight. The first one we got as well, obviously, because of the way we count them so fast in Sunderland. But you know, anyone who thinks that this is, you know, the Conservative Party is in a great place in these places where they thought they were going to do it. I'm not saying we're, we're, we, where we need to be yet, but it is significant that a real pattern has been changed tonight in those places. And um, what time's kick-off? It is a quarter to eight uh, kick-off. Johnny, Johnny is basically being unkind to you by raising the issue of football on a night when... Yeah, he's not going to be invited back either. You're... 
<laughs> if there's one thing Sunderland fans do, it's not brag about performance. In it. No, I, I was just thinking, will you still be awake at that time? Because obviously there, there was a the serious day that you've had. chance that I will fall asleep on the train and end up in, in Scotland, <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where there might be some interesting results just Indeed. coming through. So I can, I'll, if that happens, I'll pretend that was the. I match. mean, genuinely, on that, do you think Labour are going to get into second place in Scotland? And actually, is it part of the problem that we're seeing getting into second place in Scotland as being an achievement? Well, I think yes and yes is the honest answer to that. I've also been to Scotland uh, in the campaign. Really, you're nicely setting me up with examples of places I've been to, which is much uh, appreciated. But So I was in, um, I went to Recife, I to Firmland, uh, the Fife area. And look, obviously, because you have a, a proportional voting system in Scotland for local government, it's a little bit less clear cut in terms of you know, reflect the vote share rather than the, the first past the post returns for these key wards. But, you know, Anasar was doing a very good job for Labour in Scotland. And yes, again, that is from a position of. And do you know what Anasawa, you, Jackie, and I have in common? I was going somewhere till you mentioned yourself, Ian, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't, got, I haven't gone that far. Um, we are all appearing in For the Many Live. Oh, well. Because in Liverpool, on September the 25th, Johnny Reynolds is our guest at For the Many Live, isn't he? he is. And he has all he has already appeared on the podcast, don't forget. He has. Yeah. And I did yeah. joke it would be even more risque than Wes Streetings. Now, I've listened to Wes's and I'd just like to retract that <laughs> in full. But um, I'm looking forward to that. If, you live, if you're going to the Labour Party conference, I think that's an excellent it, it, And lots of tickets already sold, I'll well, have you know, which um, is, is a very good thing. And if you would like to attend this For The Many Live, you can go to my website, iandale. No, go to forthemany.live. That's the mm -hmm. website where you can buy the tickets and a good time will be had by all. And, of course, Anna Sawa is appearing with us at the Edinburgh Fringe alongside the Conservative leader, Douglas Ross. Enough of that plugging. Would be a I very think. interesting one. But Anasawa is a is a huge talent. I mean, I, he's a friend of mine. Obviously, we were elected to Parliament at the same time together. But I think what he is doing, which is maybe the toughest job in politics in some ways, um, given the SNP's you know hegemonic um, position that they were in, not I think through their own achievements, but for for reasons around the constitutional issue. He's doing a really good job, and I'm, I'm hopeful for the results there tomorrow. Now, Gareth Knight is doing more than eight hours because he's going to be with Nick Ferrari for an hour, I think, as well. Uh, we're going to go to him in a moment and get a roundup of where we are on councils, losses and gains, and council law losses and gains. You're listening to uh, LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's half past five, and time for the news with Simon Conway. Labour has taken control of Wandsworth Council in South London, which had been Conservative since 1978. The Tories have also conceded defeat in Barnet in North London in the last half hour. Results are still coming in following yesterday's uh, elections with a mixed picture elsewhere. Dozens of Tory councillors have lost their seats. Labour has lost Hull to the Liberal Democrats, but has won the brand new Cumberland Authority. Counting hasn't yet started in Scotland and Wales or for the Northern Ireland Assembly. A rescue effort is underway to get more civilians out of the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. The United Nations says a safe passage operation is in progress, but it's unclear whether that involves people trapped at a steelworks. LBC weather, rain across Northern Ireland and Scotland, moving into Wales and Northern England. Warm in the south and east with sunny spells, a high of 22 degrees. This is LBC. I've
leading Britain's conversation. LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. 5.33 on LBC. Jonathan Reynolds, Albi Amancona and Adrian Ramsey are here. If you were listening earlier, we talked to uh, Adrian's co-leader, Carla Denya, and we, we raised the subject of this policy of withdrawing from NATO, but only after the Ukraine war has finished. Um, now, Adrian, Carla was maintaining that this is not a new policy and it's all been got up. But, I mean, you did talk about it in an interview, didn't you? And it did seem to a lot of people that it was ludicrous to say, I mean, you can have an argument about withdrawing from NATO, I guess, but isn't it ludicrous to say, oh, yeah, but only after Ukraine? Because surely Ukraine is the absolute example of why we should be in NATO. So you're right, that, and Carla's right, that this is a, a long-term vision for how we need to think about the security arrangements we, we need long-term to promote peace and help the world move away from nuclear weapons. And once the dust has settled, we want to have a mature discussion about what the, um, what, the, what the best approach to that is. But that's not our focus right now. Our focus right now is on how we support the people of Ukraine, and there's lots that needs to be done to, to go further on that. So we, we have supported, as German Greens and other Greens around Europe have supported, um, the action to help the people of Ukraine. Do, and, do you, do you and, support uh, sending military weapons to Ukraine? Yes, we have. And we've been very clear on that. And that's not easy for us as a party that supports peace. But Ukraine's a sovereign nation that has an absolute right to defend itself. And, and Jackie, you were starting to ask me earlier about what's the difference between the German Greens yeah. approach and the approach of the Greens here. I'm not sure there is one. So, you know, what have the German Greens said? They've said we should um, support Ukraine to defend itself. So have we. Um, they've um, supported the EU approach of waiving visas for Ukrainian refugees so that we remove the bureaucracy. We've been calling for the UK government to do that. And the German Greens have been instrumental in saying that Europe needs to move away from sending a billion euros a day to fund Vladimir Putin's war machine by buying Russian oil and gas. Interestingly, the EU has now started to move away from, from that. And we want the UK to join in with those sanctions. So we're taking the same approach as the German Greens to how we address this conflict and support the people but of Ukraine. And that's where the focus of our discussion There's an be. interesting challenge in having uh, co-leaders in a party because it means that we get two chances to ask you the difficult questions, but it also means you get the chance to work out what the correct answer is between the first one uh, and, the, and the second one. And, and um, you know, I have to say, I think you're doing a marginally better job than Carla did in explaining your policy. But the point I was making to her is, you know, you've outlined where you think there are similarities between the British Greens and the German Greens. The point is the German Greens are in government. Absolutely, yeah. They are significant in a major European country. Mm. And it's not only because of a different uh, electoral system. So what's the, what's the reasoning behind why they are su successful and significant and mainstream in Germany? And, you know, despite your success in gaining, I think, 18 more council seats, you've never been anywhere near uh, government or even... Mm serious council leadership in uh, the well, UK. They do control Brighton. Or um, serious council <laughs> leadership in the UK. <laughs> well, we take a very serious approach to our leadership of Brighton and Hove City Council, as we do to where we have green leaders in Lancaster and Lewis District as well. And in fact, there's 15 councils in the country where Greens are part of the administration. We expect that to grow. So we are making significant progress in terms of local elections. Uh, and it's interesting your analysis in terms of national government, because in the last year, for the first time, we have Greens in government in the UK. In, in the Scottish government, there are Green ministers as part of that administration. Um, and the electoral arithmetic didn't require the SNP or the Greens to come up with an agreement. It's not quite a full coalition, but a, an agreement to work together. Both parties saw it as being in the interests of stable government and what they can both contribute to that. And we're seeing green policies implemented by green ministers within the UK and making a huge difference on issues from public transport to restoring nature to uh, uh, how, we're, how we're supporting the education system in Scotland. So it, it's, you know, we're seeing this in the UK as well as in countries across Europe and in New Zealand. More, we're getting greens in government 
um, nationally as well as more and more local councils. So we're really coming of age as a party. Um, Albie, you've given advice to Keir Starmer. What advice would you give to Adrian Ramsey on making the Greens... <laughs> a more appealing force in British politics. Because, I mean, he sounds very reasonable, doesn't he? Which, I mean, so sometimes you, I interview some Green politicians and you sort of hear the sound of flapping white coats. Well, you don't with Adrian, do you? Yes. That's a compliment, by the way, Adrian. A Adrian does sound very reasonable, <laughs> but you still can't really get over the fact that eventually you want to withdraw from NATO. And I think the situation with what's going on in Ukraine and Russia at the moment just shows why those alliances are so important. It's all well and good to be talking about nice things like electronic vehicle charges and re-greening and putting up wind turbines. But when it comes to bread and butter issues like security, policies like withdrawing from NATO are unreasonable to most people. Well, thank you for giving me your advice. I do appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so, um, well, the first thing I'd say is actually that the climate emergency is an international security issue now. and it More so than Ukraine be, at, at this uh, very no, no, point I'm, in time. I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not comparing the two. And I, right, I, I, it sounded I, I, like you were. I, no, I'm not. No, I'm, I, it was just because you were referring to security and you were... You were talking down what we're saying on energy issues. I wasn't it, talking it, it, it down. It's, I was just it, saying it, it's, 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 it's nice to talk about it, but when well, when you talk about NATO and withdrawing from NATO in the long run, it feels unreasonable to me personally. Well, it, it, it's it's more than achieving net zero carbon emissions and a tackling of climate emergency is more than nice to talk about. It's essential if we're going to deliver on those goals and and um, create a healthier environment for everybody and and uh, the real effects people will see from climate change. But what a you know, we want to have a, a mature and calm discussion about the global security structures that we need to have in place if the world is going to achieve long-term peace and move beyond a, a, a world dominated by nuclear weapons. Now, uh, I wouldn't choose to have that discussion right now. You've chosen to ask me about it. Uh, for me, the focus... Well, is only because you oh, raised it a few days ago. No, no, well, I was, I was asked about it by a, a journalist who was perhaps looking to achieve a, a headline. It wasn't what I went into the interview planning to talk yeah, about. Yeah, but if my, it's your policy, then it's well, not it's, surprising if people are going to ask you about it. Well, it? we've got policies on everything. Some of them are short-term, some of them are long-term. But the, the, our policy is not at any stage to simply leave NATO. Our policy is to build alternatives that are uh, around how we can secure um, global security, peace and cooperation and start to move the world away from nuclear weapons. And if after the dust is settled from the Ukraine conflict, which has to be our absolute focus right now, that's what I would like us to be talking about, that's where I think our focus should be, when the dust has settled, let's have a calm and mature discussion about what we've learned from this and how the world moves forward and yes we would like to see uh, alternative structures developed but Adrian. we're not talking about leaving nato it before that is done okay uh, uh, no, I, i'm i'm going to stop here because we've only we've only got 19 minutes to go <gasps> on the program and i think it's high time that we heard from gareth knight because we don't want him falling asleep over there um <laughs> can you give us the running totals uh, running totals so uh labor um are up they have just taken control of Barnet, by the way. Ah, OK. Um, up 25, and I, they, I do have plus one, but I'm assuming that one is not Barnet, so we'll say um, plus two in terms of councils. Um, but only up 25, which is not exactly a high figure. Um, the Conservatives down 96, losing control of four councils. The Lib Dems up 44. Proportionally, that is very good. That's about a 30-odd percent increase on where they were before... Um, and that's gaining one council, which we know is Kingston upon Hull. Um, the Greens have gone up 20 councillors. Um, no further control of council, but that is excellent. That's basically a 200% increase, but it is from a low base. <laughs> um, in terms of no overall control, two of them are in no overall control, and we won't know what will happen there for several weeks. Um, overall, I would say that it's relatively poor results for all parties concerned except for the Lib Dems and um, the Greens. Um, but even that is, you know, we're not talking huge numbers, are we? Oh, we're not talking hundreds of gains. There's one party that has lost net numbers of councillors 
Um, and that's the Conservative Party. So there is a losing party tonight, and it's the Conservative Party. Oh, there is, there is no, no doubt about it. The Conservatives have had the worst night so far. But the fact that Labour have only gained 25... I mean, you know, the, the, you'll remember in the mid-90s, you know, Labour were winning hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seats on nights like this. Winning 25 is... I mean, it's, I mean that's, that's barely... Yeah. But there's only about a third of the votes being counted. So, and you've got you've got Scotland to come, you've got Wales to come as well. So they will they will be net gains of three figures, won't they? Oh yeah, they, they definitely will be by the end of it. But when you consider that, um, you know, the gains that Labour are making in London, and they're only making 25 gains overall, that just shows you how many they're mm. not gaining outside. Okay, well, but it also shows you that this is a bait that the last time these seats were fought. Labour did well, and therefore they're defending a lot of seats, so therefore not able to net gain them. Yeah. Well, let's go to one of the councils uh, that Labour have gained tonight, as I just said. It's Barnet. LBC's reporter Charlotte Lynch is there. And Charlotte, you've got the outgoing council leader, Daniel Thomas, with you. Yes, that's right, Ian. I'm here with uh, Daniel Thomas, leader of the uh, Conservative group uh, in Barnet. And Mr Thomas, first of all, uh, it's confirmed the Conservatives have lost control of Barnet Council, uh, losing to Labour. How are you feeling? Absolutely gutted. I was very disappointed. Um, we've lost some very good councillors um, this morning uh, due to no uh, fault of their own. So, yeah, very, very disappointed uh, with the result. So you say no fault of their own. Who do you blame for this then? Well, it's not a matter of uh, a single person. I think it's just a perfect storm of uh, circumstances. We've got the, the, the cost of living crisis. You've got party gates. You've, the fact that the government's, you know, the Conservative government's been in power now for 12 years. And locally, we had some new ward boundaries which I think now we've seen the results um, I think I think they do favour you know the Labour Party um, slightly so I think you've got I, I can't blame our candidates or our councillors um, for those issues and they are issues that have cost them votes. Do you blame the Prime Minister? I think Partygate has got something to do with it. A lot of Conservative supporters um, said to us on the doorstep that they were upset, they were annoyed, disappointed. Um, some said they were thinking twice about coming out to vote. Um, not many said they would switch to Labour or anything like that. And I do think there is a turnout issue and a motivation issue with our own supporters and we need to reconnect with them um, if we've got any chance of uh, winning the next general election and, and, and if we get to win back Barnet in, in four years' time. Um, the Conservatives are, are making big losses in London in particular, Wandsworth um, also, I guess it's whether they, they manage to go beyond that. But if this turns out to be a disastrous night for the Tory party, would you um, call for the Prime Minister to resign? Well, it would make no difference if I did, but I think our colleagues in Westminster um, will be will be thinking about the next general election, thinking about the, the course of government, policies, um, the impact on um, on, on, on voters. Um, you know, and just before, another factor, for instance, just before um, the election, a few days before polling day, a lot of our residents, as, as, as indeed residents across the country, had their April pay slip um, and their net pay was slightly down due to the national insurance um, increase. So that added on to the cost of living and everything else going up, all the prices going up, um, that, that hasn't helped. So I think, I think that is an issue that the government needs to respond to if it is to connect, not just with our base, but with the wider public. OK, Daniel Thomas leader of the Conservative group in Barnet. Thank you very much, Ian, and, and very clear there um, the reason that he thinks uh, that Labour, that the Conservatives are, are making the losses that they're making. Charlotte, thank you very much. Uh, some big breaking news. Uh, Hugh Edwards has been caught eating a croissant live on air on the BBC election show. He says, I'm going to admit to you, no, I'm not going to do that, <laughs> that, that, that I've just had a little bit of croissant and I'm just finishing it. I'm ashamed to say that, but there you go. We haven't been caught eating anything, have we? I think you did make a point that I had oh, yeah, a packet you did. of crisps. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, yeah. public sector broadcasting. Honestly, I've never heard anything like it. <laughs> it's 5.46. LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Millions went to the polls across the United Kingdom to cast their votes in the local election. With the Prime Minister plagued by negative headlines, did it turn out to be a piece of cake for Boris Johnson? I've received a fixed penalty notice from the Metropolitan Police relating to an event. I once again offer a full apology. And has Beergate meant it all went flat for Sir Keir Starmer's chances. We were in the office, we were working, we stopped to have something to eat. There was no party, there was no breach of the rules. Join me, Nick Ferrari, for a specially extended local election special from 6am as all the results and your reactions come in. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC.
LBC's Election Night Live with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's 5.49 on LBC. Now, Johnny Runners, you wanted to talk about these latest uh, figures. Yeah, it was just uh, the win in Barnet. It means a huge amount in terms of how the Labour Party has changed in 2019. I understand, I think we're now projected to win Westminster uh, as well. But I, I think when I say we need to, we needed to see these elections, the results show a turning point, a, a positive move forward from 2019. It's not just about individual councils and individual council laws and, and wars that we've won. It's also about vote share. You know, and if we look at uh, areas particularly outside of London. I mean, I have us ahead on vote share in Lincoln, Grimsby, Peterborough, Wolverhampton, Workington, Worcester. That's the kind of progress that we needed to see. And, and whilst we're going to be really proud of these big, significant council gains in London, it's not a story just about London being good for Labour tonight. There's some really encouraging signs across the whole of the country. And that, that is what we needed, that turning point. And I think we've got that based on what we know so far. Now, we're also hearing that Labour think they have actually taken control of Westminster before we were thinking that the Conservatives had lost control. But that's one thing. If Labour take control of Westminster, Barnet and Wandsworth, Alby. I mean, that is a really serious thing for the Conservatives, isn't it? It is certainly quite significant, especially in the councils that you've just mentioned. But I think it plays into a longer-term trend of the Conservative Party not doing as well in London and doing comparatively better in other parts of the country. And that could be down to a number of reasons. It could be down to demographic change. It could be down to the pivot that we saw with the Conservative Party at the 2019 election, pivoting away from the south of the country, the home counties, the blue wall, if you call it, and up to the north of the country. There are a lot of different factors at play there, but it is certainly significant. But I think it's part of a wider trend. Well, let's just remember, in 2018, the Tories won 41 seats in Westminster to Labour's 19. Well, Hannah Neary is local democracy reporter for My London. She's at the count in Westminster this morning. Um, Hannah, is, is this true, what we're hearing, that Labour have taken control? Hi, guys. Um, well, it's looking very much like that could be the case. Um, and if so, it's huge because uh, the council's been a Tory stronghold since its inception in 1964. Um, just as I was leaving, just to get to a bit of a quieter spot, um, we heard huge cheers from Labour as they've won far more seats now in the next ward in Bayswater. Um, and they're pretty confident that they might win uh, Hyde Park, which, again, is a huge Tory stronghold. So it's definitely looking that way. What are the, how many how many seats are there still to count? Do you know? Um, I think we're over halfway, but they're all coming in really quickly, so I can't give you an exact figure. Well, I'll tell you what, Nick Ferrari is going to have an interesting programme, isn't he? Because that, that will, the final result from Westminster will come in his programme. Hannah, thank you very much indeed for that. That's Hannah Neary from My London. Um, well, Keir Starmer doesn't really need to go on a trip tomorrow, does he? He can just step outside the House of Commons. Well, it would be nice to have that, for a Labour leader to have that <laughs> problem as to which, <laughs> which one of our successors to go. Um, I I'm not in any way claiming any connection to this. I also did a visit to Westminster. Um, Adam Hug uh, is, uh, is a... You get around, Where, don't why you? did you go that we didn't do well anywhere? Uh, well, um, Scotland. I'm, uh, well, well, we don't know yet. Yeah. Uh, Scotland actually is looking quite promising, but, um, yeah, it's not the, the time to claim some sort of Reynolds factor, which is not, uh, I think, in any way going to be a significant national factor. But I was really impressed by the team in Westminster uh, and what they were saying. They were clearly excellent candidates with a really solid uh, position they were putting forward. And, and, and this is really positive. There's, there's, there's different types of success for Labour tonight. And I think sometimes, you know, the political conversation in this country is focused on a certain set of seats or a certain geography in the country. The, the fact is, Labour as a national party and we want to win in all parts of the country that is what we need to do as i say no one's saying it's job done but there's a lot of encouraging signs here a real turn you're sounding a little bit perkier than you were a couple of hours ago well it's because i'm five minutes i'm off home <laughs> <laughs> no no it, do it another hour, yeah. I'm, sort of, I'm sort of this has not been an election night where um, you know, despite um, what we just heard about, you know, where Labour winning Westminster is huge. It, it actually hasn't been an election night where there have been sort of shocking turn ups for the book or, you know, things that people really, really weren't expecting. Because we did start the evening saying there's a possibility for Labour in Wandsworth and Westminster and Barnet. And those things have emerged. That's clearly satisfactory for Labour. And we're also not in a position where the Tories have done so badly that we're going to be thinking about 
the Tory MPs uh, issuing their letters. So to that extent, although clearly we haven't finished yet, and we've got Scotland and we've got Wales, and of course we started as well talking about the signif- potential real significance of what's happening in Northern Ireland. Um, nothing, you know, it has been interesting and it has been um, significant in terms of the progress that Labour has made, as, as Johnny says. It hasn't been groundbreaking, apart from obviously our excellent coverage of it. Well, indeed, as many people are saying on Twitter and text, but I'm too bashful to read them all out. Yeah, I, I, know that you're not, not. I know you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gareth Knight, this will be the last chance we've got to speak to you. Just give us your analysis of where we are now and what's likely to happen over the course of the next 24, 48 hours. I think what we're seeing is, I don't want to say the death of the Conservative Party in London, but it's certainly it's certainly looking very ominous for them. There are more of us in the studio than there are Conservative councillors in Redbridge, formerly a very safe Conservative borough, in Camden, in Richmond, in Ealing. These are all boroughs where the Conservatives were either in overall control or sharing control within the last 10 years. Um, the Conservatives are in deep trouble in London. However... That is being offset to some degree by um, some stability and even some small gains in the north. Um, I would say the Liberal Democrats are back at local government level. I think they're making a decent number of gains. They've actually made more gains than Labour have tonight. Um, And the Greens have made some steady progress. But the big story is going to be Conservative losses in London. You can't get away from that. And certainly, um, even if the Conservatives manage to win Croydon, the mayoral result is due very late tomorrow. That's not going to offset the Conservatives potentially losing Westminster. That's not confirmed yet. Wandsworth and Barnet are, um, but Westminster would be a big psychological blow. Adrian Ramsey, quick final word from you. Well, we've been talking about London and lots of results to come later in the day. And I was out campaigning in Islington yesterday where it was looking very hopeful, as it is for Greens in a number of other London boroughs, particularly ones where there's super majorities and Greens are campaigning to get a strong opposition voice on the council. So hopeful for that, as we are for further substantial gains from Labour and from the Conservatives right across the country. I'll be 30 seconds. Yes, the Conservative Party have seen substantial loss in London offset by stability and gains in the north. I think we do definitely need to look at what our offer is to young people in London. And Johnny Reynolds. Happy but humble. We know there's more (laughs) to do. And, however, it's the turning point we wanted to see from that general election disaster that we had in 2019. And I think a strong endorsement of some of the the big and at times difficult decisions Keir Starmer has taken. You've seen that in some of the results tonight. Uh, Well, Jackie Smith, we've been going now for seven hours uh, and 57 minutes. Um, Just a few final thoughts from you, reflections on the evening? Well, first of all, if our podcast wasn't called For the Many, I think it should be called Happy But Humble. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if he ever starts a podcast, there he goes. A breakaway just wears an eye with happy. (laughs) It has been interesting. provisional version of the For the Many podcast. It's been really interesting. It hasn't been groundbreaking for anybody, but there are more interesting results to come in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, and I know that... LBC and you will be providing analysis on those, Ian. And uh, if you've enjoyed Jackie's coverage with me tonight, uh, do try For The Many, which you, if you haven't done before. I can't believe people still haven't. But it, we, we do a new episode every Friday or Saturday. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, and of course, it's always available on Global Player. Well, across LBC and LBC News, that was Election Night Live with me, Ian Dale and Jackie Smith. I want to pay tribute to all of our production team led by the brilliant, the brilliant Corey Froggart, who's had a lot to put up with over the past few days, and he's come through it absolutely brilliantly. I can't mention every single person uh, who's been involved with this production because I'd forget somebody, and nobody would like that, would they? But it's been a... I I can see on my text screen here, I think all of you that have stayed with us, stayed with the course, I think you've enjoyed what we've done. Gareth Knight, thank you very much to you. Thank you to Adrian Ramsey, Albie Amancona, Johnny Reynolds, and of course... The wonderful, the one and only. See, I'm trying to drag this out now. You are, no, are you? Do you want me to provide you with a bit of smut to take us another 15 no, seconds? No, we, re- we really don't want that. So, the very latest on the local election fallout continues with Lisa Aziz on LBC News. And, of course, you're going to be spending the next, is it three or four hours, with the one and only Nick Ferrari at breakfast. <laughs>